Good evening and welcome to the Spokane City Council Legislative Session for August 22nd. If you'd please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Zapone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, we have the privilege of some poetry at the podium tonight. We have our poet laureate, Chris Cook, here with poet Christina Poffenroth. Thank you. Here's the poem I wrote for Spokane's In the Neighborhood Poet Laureate Project. This is called Bones. Mm -hmm. This dog park on Pacific, once a graveyard, is included in the Browns Edition Haunted Tour, even though the bones of its occupants, immigrant laborers on whose backs the railroad was built, were exhumed and relocated in the 1980s. Yet I know people who still won't walk here out of respect for the dead. As my dog goes back to the same spot to dig, I wonder if their backs are bearing my weight, worry that maybe six feet hasn't always been the standard depth. Here's my fellow Spokane poet, Christina Poffenroth. Hello. Uh, this is a poem about uh, the neighborhood my husband and I just moved into back in 2020, Emerson Garfield. Uh, the Unfamiliar Gardener. I don't know what blooms await us, newcomers to this specific spot of soil, still learning how to work the earth. Each morning, I trickle out the front door and wander through the yard, wondering if the dirt under my fingernails will whisper of the fruit our trees will bear before they bear it wondering if I am a worthy enough steward to cultivate this Eden, to reap the apples from this tree that has survived generations of tempests. I've not yet gleaned any answers from the garden, but I've discovered the alien red tendrils of peonies poking through the loam, and the lilacs are sprouting their heart leaves, making quiet promises. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. That's great. All right, and we have a salutation. Council Member Wilkerson. If I could ask the Hemp Hills to come to the podium, please. Thank you both for coming down tonight and taking the time. Before I start this, I have to say they've been in business for 30 years, but I have known them much longer than that. Each one of them have mentored my children as they have grown up into, I would say productive adults, but that's probably up for speculation at this point in time. And just your steadfastness in the community has been an inspiration especially to the people of color in Spokane. And I am honored, almost crying, moved to read this salutation to the both of you tonight. Whereas Bob Hemphill and Teresa Hemphill have served hungry guest Americans Southern style food in downtown Spokane since the 1st of July, 1992, and is currently the longest running black owned restaurant in the city of Spokane. And whereas Bob and Teresa are guided by their love and service of community and the principle of, if there is a need and you fulfill people's need, you will always be successful. And whereas in Spokane, Bob knows everyone and everyone knows Bob with even Mayor Jim West once saying that 
He never makes any decisions, any big decisions, without visiting Bob's first. Whereas three generations have now served Spokane staples like fried chicken, fried catfish, hot links, my favorite, barbecue ribs, collard greens, and homemade cobbler, along with selling Old South barbecue sauce, the Hemp Hill's own special recipe a barbecue sauce that is sold in local Spokane markets, building generational wealth and creating a wonderful example of a Spokane success story. Now, therefore, I, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the community members of Spokane, hereby salute the Hemp Hills and their chicken and mo family for their 30 years of service to the city of Spokane. <laughs> And you can. Thank you, Susan. Hold real quick. I don't do slides. <laughs> and if you have any wisdom you want to give us or reflection, feel free. Right Say a few words. You? Yeah. No, you. Oh. <laughs> My wife always tell me I talk too long, but <laughs> I'll cut it short. <laughs> uh, this is my beginning here. I started out here when I first moved here 45 years ago. I was a salesman for Montgomery Wards. I was the only Blight salesman that they had at that time because they didn't think Blights could sell major appliances to white. So they gave me a job, and I was one of the top salesmen they had working there because I knew that if you supply the need of a person and tell them you to give them what they want, they'll take it home with them. So it doesn't matter whether you black or white. It was just supplying the need. Hey, let me thank Spokane for the being the greatest city in the world. Amen. Matter of fact, uh, when I came here, I was a mess. And uh, Spokane gave me an opportunity to change my life. And I'm so happy that uh, I moved to Spokane in 1976, and it's been the greatest time of my life. I want to thank uh, Mayor West, Mayor, Mayor Jim Chase. All of these guys really, really helped me and had a lot of uh, influence on me. Carl Maxey. Katie Rinkowski is the one that gave me the loan to start Chick anymore. She helped me uh, get it started. We always talking about fulfilling the need. When she was teaching at Washington State University, I had a used car lot in the auto center and the cab company down on Monroe, and she used to come down there film me and to talk to her students about fulfilling the need. So anybody that had a need, and if you fulfill that need, you're going to be successful. Uh, Mayor Bernard, she helped me tremendously. And Mary Vernon, Mayor uh, Vernon, she helped me too. So I had a lot of help. I, I didn't do it by myself. I had a lot of help. And my girlfriend here, she's been by my side. <laughs> she, she made life a lot easier for me because she's sweet and kind and loving and and uh, she do all these sweet things for me and everything. So I just loved it. I love Spokane. I don't want nobody to ever tell anybody I don't love Spokane. I love Spokane. It's a great, great, great city. And I wish everybody loves Spokane. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, is there anyone here from the North Hill Neighborhood Council? We were going to have a report from them, but I believe their neighborhood chair may have changed. So last call for North Hill. All right. We'll get them another time. All right. That gets us to the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, if you could read the consent agenda. 
Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, public works agreement with Pro Mechanical Services Incorporated, Spokane, for HVAC replacement at Fire Station 17 from August 25, 2022 through August 24, 2023. $74,500, including tax and administrative reserve of approximately 10% to cover potential price increases that may occur between the bid date and council approval. Number two, contract with Environment and Control of Spokane, Spokane Valley, Washington, for janitorial services at five fire department facilities from July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2025, $64,027 annually, including tax. Number three, accept grant funds from the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission as part of their dynamic, diverse, community-oriented police force recruitment and retention program, $54,450, relates to special budget ordinance C36256. Number four, accept grant funds from the Department of Justice's Office on Violence Against Women Firearms Technical Assistance Project Pilot Sites Initiative, $499,833 relates to Special Budget Ordinance C36257. Item number five, Memorandum of Understanding with Spokane County to apply for and split the fiscal year 2022 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program grant total amount to be requested, $180,880. City portion $81,396, county portion $99,484. Number six, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through August 12, 2022. Total $10,342,292.10 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $9,487,072.69. Item number seven, city council meeting minutes for August 1 and August 18, 2022. All right, um, I had one person signed up, but I'm not sure if you were thinking it was the open forum as opposed to consent agenda, and that was Tracy Blum or Bloom. Okay, okay. All right, thanks, Tracy. All right, is there any council commentary on that? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, the consent agenda is approved. And that gets us to our first special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36256, amending ordinance number C36161, passed by the City Council December 13, 2021, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in. Public Safety and Judicial Grant Fund, number one, increase revenue by $55,450. A, $55,450 of the increased revenue is from a Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission grant award. Number two, increase the appropriation by $55,450. A, of the increased appropriation, $6,000 is provided solely for a targeted social media campaign. B, of the increased appropriation, $35,450 is provided solely for recruitment trips and travel. C, of the increased appropriation, $14,000 is provided solely for a general media campaign. This action arises from the need to reflect newly awarded grant funds to be used to increase the department's hiring and recru recruiting activities. All right. Tracy, you signed up for this one. Are you wanting to testify about this or not? Okay. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, there's no other public comment. Any commentary from council members? All right. Prepare to vote. All right. That passes 7 to 0. Ordinance C36257, Public Safety and Judicial Grant Fund, number one, increased revenue by $499,833. A, of the increased revenue, $499,833 is from the Office on Violence Against Women as part of the Firearms Technical Assistance Project Pilot Sites Initiative Solicitation. Number two, increase appropriation by $499,833. A, of the increased appropriation, approximately $156,000 will be used to fund a FTAP coordinator. B, of the increased appropriation, approximately $86,000 will be used for training. C, of the increased appropriation, approximately $257,833 will be used towards overtime and creation of an on-call responsive advocacy response. This action arises from the need to reflect newly awarded grant funds to be used to establish a multidisciplinary management team to develop and implement strategic plans addressing firearms restrictions and domestic violence cases. 
All right, thumbs up again, Tracy. Okay, great. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Ordinance C36258, Public Safety and Judicial Grant Fund, number one, increased revenue by $48,776. A, $48,776 of the increased revenue is from a Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs Grant Award as part of the Washington Auto Theft Prevention Authority Program. Number two, increase the appropriation by $48,776. A, of the increased appropriation, $48,776 is provided solely for equipment to expand the automatic license plate reader network. This action arises from the need to reflect newly awarded grant funds to be used to procure ALPR equipment. All right. Tracy, again, all right, we got gotcha. you. Any uh, council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right. Seven to zero. Ordinance C36193, Forfeitures and Contributions Fund, number one, increase appropriations by $175,000. A of the increased appropriations, $40,000 of the increase is to be used as confidential funds used for controlled purchases of illegal substances. B, $125,000 shall be used to fund a request for proposal to nonprofit entities that provide at risk use services that will support prevention of drug use and drug crimes using peer support and leadership from individuals who have successfully exited criminal justice involvement. C, $10,000 for training. Two, the increased appropriation is funded from unappropriated reserves in the Forfeitures and Contributions Fund. This action arises from the need to continue and expand the use of confidential funds. Deferred from August 15, 2022 agenda. All right, same for you, Tracy. All right, um, I'm gonna invite up uh, one other community member, but just to remind people on the rules of testifying in this section of the meeting, uh, we, ha we did clapping for poets and proclamations and such, but in this one, we don't uh, make any noise, either pro or con, clapping, booing, uh, cheering, sign waving, uh, and direct your comments to um, the council president and um, we ask that you don't disparage uh, individual people. Um, you'll have up to three minutes. When we have one minute left, it'll turn yellow, and then at the end of three minutes, it will turn red. And if you haven't noticed it, I will remind you that your time is up. And with that, we have one um, other person uh, testifying on this one, and that is Craig Mido. Good evening, Council Council President, members of the Council. I'm Craig Miles, Spokane Police Department. Uh, I am here to testify opposed to this ordinance, and I'd like to give you just a, a real quick overview of why I'm opposed to this. So this ordinance has to do with asset forfeiture funds, and specifically we're talking about state funds. Right now in that, in that balance, we have $625,000 in the state forfeiture fund. Uh, typically, year to year, we're asking for about $120,000 from that fund for uh, drug investigations, CI payment, drug payments, things of that nature. Um, we also uh, try to replace our undercover cars out of that budget as well. It used to be you could buy an undercover car for about $25,000. Uh, Fleet has apparently told us you're not going to get a car worth buying at $25,000 with the nationwide trend we're seeing with vehicles. So. Each car that is, is worthy enough to buy to replace a current car is gonna be about 40,000. So if we try to keep a rotation going of our undercover cars, you're talking three cars at 40,000. That's another 120,000 on top of the seizure money. <clears throat> if, we, if we go to this youth intervention program, and let me be very, very clear, I am totally supportive of youth intervention. I think it's a very noble cause, but I also know we are seeing a huge increase in drug overdose deaths, fentanyl and meth is still a close second as well. When you look at uh, what, the, what our, our remaining funds will be in this as, a, asset forfeiture account in 2023, if we move forward with this proposal of 125,000 for youth intervention, that will reduce this balance down to 240,000. So that means next year, uh, when we come to the council and ask for $120,000, that will be half of that balance. And then we either have to buy three undercover cars and there's no money for youth intervention or we do youth intervention. So we will completely 
deplete this account next year if we move forward with the youth intervention. Uh, I want to point out as well, last year, according to the CDC, there's a 9% increase in national overdose deaths. In Washington State, there's a 26% increase in overdose deaths in Washington State, almost three times the national average. So we do not want to drain this account. We have been trying to be good stewards of this account. Every year, it's inconsistent how much comes in. We can't rely on this money. Some years may be, may be bigger than other years. Uh, in the process of being good stewards as well. And we've had to turn down numerous requests for training, for equipment, and et cetera, to make sure we keep a fund in here. And I'm gonna go super quick since I see my time's running out, but here's just one request from one precinct. This is the downtown precinct for training. Uh, the SEPTED training, advanced training, street crimes, crisis negotiations, National Association of Women Law Enforcement Executives, National Code Responder Training for our BHU officers, basic hostage negotiation team, uh, FBI leadership schools, and then when we go to investigations, a very small, small list is for equipment, shields, uh, binoculars, cameras, et cetera. So we have more asks than is currently in this account as it stands, but we try to be good stewards of only basically using what we know we can afford to make sure that we have enough in there for drug investigations as well. So uh, for that reason, I am asking um, that the council would consider uh, not passing this um, because it will deplete this, right. this account next year if we go down this road. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Council President. Yeah. Can I ask a question of the chief? Well, can we move to extend his time, first of all, so we can ask questions? Well, we can. Yeah. Okay. So your motion is to extend, extend time, time to ans an answer yes. questions. Yes. Okay. That's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? about? Can we, can we just call him up without having to extend his time? Well, that, well, he's testifying as a witness, not as a, in an okay. official. He's testifying in his personal capacity. Well, um, I don't think he is. I think he's testifying as the chief of police. Well, he signed up on the community uh, thing. But regardless of that, are you any other discussion about extending time to answer our questions? All right. Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay. Seven to zero. Who had the first question? I think Karen had her hand up first. Okay, Councilmember Stratton. Hi, Chief. Hi. I don't know if you watched our briefing this afternoon. We had this discussion as we were going through the agenda items. And one of the um, glaring things that, that um, came to me during our discussion of this was that we really all want the same thing. Um, and there seems to be some frustration that we just never have the time to have the conversations and to get the information um, provided to us um, to make good decisions and to support um, you on this. So my question is, if you would support a deferral of this and then we set up, maybe it's a, stu a full study session with you, with your officers that deal with the drug patrols and all of that, so we have a better understanding. I mean, you brought up so much that, you know, youth intervention, drugs, death, fentanyl, overdose. Um, you know, there's the costs. And I'm just thinking, I think we would be better representatives of the community if we were all to sit down in the same room and have a Q&A and educate us so we can make a better decision on where this funding, you know, that we could agree on where this funding could go. And I just wanted to see what your level of um, support of just deferring it and then getting something set up where, and maybe make that a, um, a you know, a routine quarterly issue, you know, where quarterly we have an issue that's important to the police department and you know this, this stuff is coming up and how do we sit down and get it out there on the table and talk about it so we know we don't have to keep deferring things. Yeah, absolutely willing to. So um, for the last two years, we've asked for $120,000 uh, for drug investigations. We've been given 80. So you figure that 80 gets us about two thirds of the way through the year. We're bumping up against that of running out of uh, the funds that we use for drug investigations. If we are asking to extend this out another month, um, I think we could probably uh, use what we have left in that, in that budget right now. And I don't have that number in front of me 
and then we could probably find another way of, of trying to ensure that we can continue those investigations until we can get that other 40,000 approved. And just kind of get us all on the same understanding, sure. the same plate. Yeah. And we can, there's time on, I think on public safety this Monday, if study session isn't available, we and could do that. Maybe we could work with um, Hannah Lee to see where we can, where we can get it in soon so we don't keep this going on forever. But I just think it's a shame if we don't take advantage of, of the time to just kind of get our questions out and make sure that we know, um, you know, where the most need is. I would love to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would, oh, I'm sorry. You can still make your motion. But. So I would like to make a motion that we defer it. Um, and that we set up some time in the next week for either a study session or a committee hearing to just sit down and hash through this so we get a better understanding of what all this involves. Okay, thank you. Would that I'll be second. The, uh, like the week after Labor Day or? Yeah, could you go that long, the week after yeah. Labor Day? Okay. That's the 13th. The 13th of September? The 12th. 12th, sorry. I will second. Okay. okay. So motion to defer to the 12th, second. Further conversation, including Council Member Briggs? Yeah. Have, has a presentation been made on this to us before? Um, we, we have had conversations um, briefly at public safety. There's been a lot of email communication yeah. back and forth on this as well. Um, so as far as any kind of robust discussion, uh, down to this level of detail, I, I don't think that's ha that has occurred. We have met, we did meet with Council President and uh, Councilwoman Kinnear probably a month or so ago to discuss this as well, but I don't, that wasn't inclusive of all the council. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how many times this one's been deferred? I do not. Okay. I know it's been deferred um, uh, quite a bit, and um, I, I understand deferring to make sure that we get it, we get it done, and I, I totally get it. Um, you know, uh, with with a deferral, would you see yourself or your department approving the hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for youth services? Or, in your opinion, is that um, um, is that money found better found elsewhere? Um, that that's a fair question. So, regardless of whether we defer it or not, um, the the information and the amount that is in that balance right now, it won't matter whether we defer it or not. That it, we will deplete this our entire asset forfeiture account uh, next year, and we'll have no, we have no guarantee of what comes in next year. It could be, it could be fairly significant. It could be almost next to nothing. And uh, obviously, because we've made great effort to try to keep enough in there for at least several years, um, I couldn't in good conscience agree to that. Mm -hmm. I, it would just be, it would, draining the account to me would be, on my part, I feel like I would be reckless if I agreed to that. Yeah. And uh, what are these funds established? Uh, what is the purpose of these funds? Um, there, there's, there's a list of different things they can be spent on. Um, you know, when you, the way I read it, it looks like it's primarily for law enforcement, drug investigations. I think there's a reason why the statutes require the chief of police to, to agree with whatever they're spent on. To me, that is an indication that when the legislators crafted this, they wanted to make sure that the police department was able to look at what do they feel their priorities are in helping to address the drug issues that we have. Mm -hmm. Again, that's my interpretation. How many other municipalities require city council oversight for their forfeiture dollars? Uh, in the state of, the Washington, state of Washington, of the probably 280-ish, uh, none that I'm aware of. Okay, so this is somewhat of a unique situation where city council has to approve those. There is oversight on these dollars outside of city council, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and who, who oversees that? So in order for a seizure to go through, uh, there, it has to be signed off by the prosecutor's office, and then these funds also get audited uh, frequently to make sure that we're spending them appropriately. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I will not be in support of a deferral tonight, and the reason why is because we have, we have deferred this several times. Um, I'm also not in support of spending $125,000 from this fund towards youth programs. As we discussed earlier, I think that the youth programs are a fantastic idea. We should absolutely be teaching children about the dangers of drugs and how seriously, um, especially fentanyl, one pill can kill. Um, I did a demonstration earlier about how two milligrams of fentanyl can kill somebody. And if you think about a sweet and low packet, you're at a diner, you have some coffee, you take out your sweet and low packet, you put it in there. That's one gram. If you, if you just think in your head of how, how much is inside 
of a sweet and low packet or a sugar packet or something like that. That's one gram. That's 500 individuals that would die from that amount of fentanyl. That's how dangerous fentanyl is. Spokane being in its proximity between Seattle and uh, Minneapolis. We are a huge trafficking city. And these dollars, what they should be used for and what they are intended for is to help us understand and figure out who are dealing and trafficking drugs in our city because these pills are killing our children. As we're talking about protecting children, they are killing our children. They are killing our families. They are, they are destroying this city. And we absolutely must be using these dollars to figure out who is responsible for the destruction that is happening in our city. And I understand the youth programs. I think they're fantastic. They should not come out of these dollars, these dollars for a very specific purpose. And so tonight I'm not in support of this. Uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, we make it so difficult for you to fight the drug epidemic in the city of Spokane. And I hope that we, we find a better way to accomplish all of our goals, which I know that all of us want to fight the drug problem in the city of Spokane, and we all want to educate youth, and I appreciate that about all of us. I think this is the wrong way to do it. Councilmember Kinnear and then Councilmember Cathcart. Thank you. I think uh, the reason, I, I'm, I don't mean to speak for you, Councilmember Stratton, but I think the reason that we, that Councilmember Stratton is asking for a deferral is so we can all get on the same page, not necessarily that the chief is going to agree with us, but that we can better understand where the police department is coming from and we all get the same information at the same time. And I think that's critical. And I think communication is never wasted. So we absolutely have to have that conversation so that we know we all hear from you the same information at the same time. We can ask questions and just get down to it and find out what are you willing to do? What are we willing to do and why? And so perhaps it's you telling us, here's why. Because right now I'm not convinced. I, I do want drugs off the street, but I'm not convinced that we can't use, that we can't do both. So if we all have that same conversation, we're likely to get to a good place. That's the reason for the deferral. And my other thought would be, as we, if, if this passes and we do have the group conversation, that it would be a public meeting so the, the community could listen, could attend, could hear some of these terrible stories and I mean I agree we've got to do everything we can to save lives but it's just an issue that I, I think requires some elevation and that we're all talking at the same time with each other uh, the community can listen in and so that we all know what what the status is and and how bad this is and and what resources you need to deal with it I, I think it's a it's a, a good opportunity to do both so. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. I just um, I agree with what um, Councilmember Bingle said, and I also agree somewhat with what uh, Council Members um, Kinnear and Stratton have said. I, uh, you know, I, I think we've all gotten the information. I mean, you've you've just delivered it straight to us tonight, so I know we we know exactly what it is that that you're looking for and what your concerns are. So we we've gotten the information. Um, but I'm also not willing to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I know that we have two options in front of us. We either defer or we pass it as is tonight. That's basically what, what is gonna happen. That's the outcome I think that's already set in stone. So um, I would much rather defer this, give us a little bit of extra time to get it right. You said that you can manage three more weeks. Um, and if you couldn't, that would certainly um, be a different situation. But since you've said that you can, uh, I think that gives us more time to talk and to consider what is the at-risk youth service, what, what does that even look like? I don't think we've ever really even discussed that in a robust way. And so who runs it, who operates it, who formulates that? You know, I'm a big proponent of <clears throat> reconstituting DARE. I think it's a wonderful program. I would love to see SPD lead that in our schools. I think that's a great way to create some really positive interactions with the community members, um, especially our, our um, students and kids. Um, and so I would support immediately using $100,000 out of ARPA to help to, to put that together and, and get us on that, on that road. But to take it out of this, as you've already described, is obviously going to create a lot of trouble for you guys. And you've already struggled to get enough um, of the, the money you've requested for, those, for the, the drug buys and your CIs and stuff like that. So to me, I think of the options in front of us, the best choice is to defer this for three weeks, come back. Um, hopefully we can, we can all get on the same page in terms of 
where the money should come from for the at-risk youth services and the right amount um, and acknowledge kind of what the forfeiture dollars are supposed to be used for. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. So the special budget ordinance is for the 40,000 for uh, forfeitures. Council had already approved 80,000 earlier in the year. So this 40,000 gets you to the 120 that you had actually wanted to begin with. So we have crossed um, that threshold. All the other things you brought up about the cars and um, the training and the uh, equipment was not part of this ordinance. So I will have to agree, we should defer because you inserted other things mm -hmm that go along with this ordinance that has not been discussed, has not been budgeted for, and what the cost is. And also, it would inform me of what kind of outcomes have, been, have happened with when we uh, pay our informants. We don't know how far that has gotten us and really uh, how effective it's been. And then this training, education for youth, how far upstream do we have to go to really make an impact and I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But until there's some kind of numbers put to it and some expected outcomes, uh, then it's just hard for me just to go forward. I have a quick question for you. Um, this was scheduled to approve your 40,000, I think as at least as far back as June. And we've, we've deferred it a few times that my understanding was the request of uh, SPD leadership because uh, they wanted to keep talking about some of these other issues. But I just want to be clear, because I'll either go with the deferral, if that's what you want to do, or if you want us to vote tonight, because we need to get the 40,000 approved, whichever way. So I just want to make sure that if we're deferring it, it's because you would like us to defer it, as opposed to hearing later that we're the ones delaying. So what's your sense of that? Yeah, so it, it's, um, again, with, without rehashing all the numbers, if we if we go down the road of that $125,000 for youth intervention, and, and I agree with everyone everyone here, that's important, um, but, but what I'm saying is if we go down that route, we will have uh, next year when we spend money on just what we need for investigations, plus to continue this program, my sense is we're not gonna just spend $125,000 one year and be done with it, so if we redo this again in 2023, we will literally have $692 in our asset forfeiture account. Um, so a, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. So I would rather defer to try to get that 40,000 that we need uh, and go through what it's gonna take us to get through for three weeks than next year realizing we have no more money in our asset forfeiture account at all. And, and I do wanna point out as well, and I think we all understand this with, with looking at the overdose deaths, especially the 26% increase in Washington State, Spokane community was one of the top 11 communities in the nation that the Department of Justice said, you guys have an issue with drugs. Uh, intervention and prevention is one prong an equally important prong is going to be going after the dealers. And that's what we do with these. We go after the dealers. And, and uh, those oftentimes will lead us to dealers that are outside Spokane. Um, and we could probably get, without getting into specifics, give you some examples of some of the dealers we've gotten into mm -hmm. because of our, our drug purchases here from dealers. And some of those will, will lead back to Mexico as well. So the deferral is your preference. Just, yes, sir. Okay. That is correct. Just, just want to be clear. But Councilor I, I also want to mention this has been deferred a, a few times, and when it says requested by SPD, it makes it seem as if you know you, there was things that you weren't ready on. But is it because there was things in here you needed to add to ask for, or that we were adding things as a council, adding budget items to this that you were not in favor of and that you did not approve of because these dollars have to be approved by the chief of police? Um, so I think what I'd, uh, what I'd hoped to accomplish in the deferrals was to talk about that $125,000. That is part of this ordinance now, and um, I think it's been a busy summer for everyone. I think everyone's going in a million different directions. Um, so for me, my, my hope had been to do what Councilwoman Stratton had said, is let's sit down and have a discussion and share all of the, the information and the impact this will have on our drug investigations if we go down this road. Um, and just a point of clarification for Councilwoman Wilkerson. Yeah, I, I just used the, all the stuff that we're being asked for just to illustrate the things we turned down so that we can keep that fund uh, where we need it to be for a future, uh, future year or years as well. That's, these aren't asks right now, although they're asks from the captains. We also acknowledge if we go down this road now with all of the training and equipment requests, uh, we would 
even without the youth intervention, we would deplete this fund with all the asks that we get as well. And there, every, every year we get these asks. So there's, there's a big need on, on Spokane PD for, for training and for equipment. And uh, just as there is for every department of the city. And so what this does is because we're 24 seven, uh, the most highly visible and, and you could argue the most contentious department in the city, we wanna make sure that we're giving our officers the best training and equipment we can. And this helps fill that gap somewhat, not to the extent that the department wishes we would, but that's where we have to be the ones who say, we, we can't afford to deplete this account that much. I'm not sure if that answers your question, I'm sorry. I think it did, um, I appreciate that. I, I would just also like to highlight um, a member of the audience, Mr. Bill Hislop is here. Um, if anybody has any questions on the dangers of fentanyl, out, you would like an outside perspective from the police department, Mr. Bill Hislop would be a great resource for all of us on council to be able to understand the, the, the true challenge that we're, we're facing here in the city and so. Any other discussion about motion to defer to the 13th? I'll just say one thing. If this passes, I give you my word that I will work with you and whoever else we need to work with and Hannah Lee to get something set up to give you an idea of what kind of questions collectively we have. So that won't be a waste of anybody's time. It'll be a good discussion and we can move this forward quickly. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one top of that list is if we could get the revenues from forfeitures for the last five years. Because um, if I calculated correctly, after, if we had voted on this tonight, there'd be $400,000. We already bought the cars for this year. We will have given you everything you wanted for drug buying and informants. And we still would have been able to fund um, the youth programs, which are just one way of addressing the fentanyl that you're so concerned with. So I see us as assuming we kept getting money in I'm not sure that I see that. So that's what we're really gonna to wanna to look at. Um, uh, we have discussed um, the importance of your drug buying funds and youth education as the top priorities, one from department, one from council, and making sure you have a healthy reserve. And I do have a, a proposed ordinance that we're gonna brief at public safety on Monday as well. They'll fit in nicely. In fact, we could just, expand the discussion on that to all these things because I totally heard from you. You need your 120,000, council needs its youth education and we need a healthy reserve so that we're not worried about exhausting things. So, so with that, if there's a vote, all those in favor of deferring? To, oh, sorry, go ahead. just real fast. You, you've mentioned in the past too that there are some specific um, like uh, auditing and accounting requirements from the state or the federal government when Correct. you get these dollars. I just, I don't know a lot about that. So when we have this discussion, it'd be great just to have some bullets on that a that we can go over. All those in favor of deferring to the 13th, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? All right, six to one, we'll the, see you on- The 12th. Excuse me, I keep saying the 13th, but that is a Scrivener's error from my mouth. It's the 12th, <laughs> uh, from the 12th. All right, so that is deferred. Ordinance C36239, determining the process and criteria for siting essential city facilities, amending section 12.05.005, and enacting new sections 12.05.062 and 12.05.063 of the Spokane Municipal Code, and declaring an emergency deferred from August 1, 2022 agenda. And on that one, uh, just if you're watching or you're in the audience, we did substitute that pretty significantly in terms of uh, city utilities. They brought us some concerns and we accepted all those to make it clear that it's not every pipe that needs a public process. They also want us to change the name instead of essential public facilities to basic city facilities because of the Growth Management Act and confusion on that. Also city legal wanted to make it clear that there's Nothing in the ordinance that gave someone an extra right to sue the city. They would just have the same right to sue the city for enforcing the law that anyone all would always have. So those were a few um, changes and they were only adopted not that long ago. So they're not online. But with that, we have several people who have asked to testify. And we'll start with uh, Mayor Nadine Woodward. And after uh, Mayor Woodward is Earl Moore and then Rook Bocook. And again, we have these two seats up here that people can start filling in when I call your name so that we can minimize the transit time and uh, maximize the testimony time. 
Thanks, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Council President and members of the Council. Uh, I am joining many, many community members here tonight in opposing your sitting or siding city facilities ordinance. Uh, this legislation is dangerous, it's retaliatory, it continues a consistent attack on the independent authority of the office of mayor, specifically the authority to run the city operation as defined by our city charter. This latest council action is a direct response to my decision to open a police precinct in the former East Central Library. That decision followed extensive community outreach that began with a request from the Martin Luther King Jr. Center, which shares a parking lot with the building. The effective date for enforcement of this uh, ordinance was purposely selected to retroactively include the opening of the police precinct nearly 60 days ago. It was you, City Council, that led a significant portion of the community outreach that showed overwhelming support for officers moving in, and now, you are disregarding the feedback that you received. You launched a thought exchange survey last December with one council member even saying it was the perfect tool to engage our community. More than 600 people responded and the majority favored a police precinct in East Central. Thought exchange is a perfect tool unless you don't like the results. Before the survey was even launched, an email was sent to some council members from a council staffer that said, quote, time is of the essence. We can start on the smaller tactics like securing community partners that support not having a police precinct in East Central. Your idea of securing community partners was hand-selecting organizations that you wanted to see in the library, not police and not by a public process. This ordinance has been considered as emergency legislation to prevent the administration from making decisions and using buildings that the city already owns. At the same time, you, Council, are pushing to rapidly purchase a building at a cost to taxpayers that will likely exceed $15 million for a municipal justice center without a competitive process and without public input. The municipal justice center, which would include municipal courts, and holding cells for defendants is purposely omitted from the definition in this ordinance of public safety facilities despite its obvious connection to the criminal justice system. That's the definition of hypocrisy. Neighbors have overwhelmingly embraced and welcomed police officers working in their neighborhood. That comes as no surprise because of the considerable community engagement that was done to make best use of a taxpayer asset while not incurring unnecessary additional costs to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Earl Moore, and then Rook Wilcook, and then Dave Bilsland. Welcome, Earl. Thank you. Glad to be here. I, I, I am going to read this because I do not want to rant and rave. I'm, Okay. I, I would say that uh, this ordinance invites a citizen to seek injunctive relief, which, if granted by the judge, would put a stop to all city services at the site in question. Example, if someone sues and is granted injunctive relief over the siting of the East Central Precinct not following the process outlined in the ordinance, we would have to stop all police services out of that precinct, which services everything south of the river except downtown. I think um, the community, through a public input process supported by council, overwhelmingly supported a public safety presence in the Old Spokane Library. This ordinance would jeopardize that police precinct and goes against the will of the people directly affected by this precinct. City council is not, I'm sorry, but you are not the public safety experts in my city and they, you should not be placing criteria on the Spokane Police Department and administration to perform their public safety services. There is no discernible emergency at all, and that which you, the council, is clarifying this as. If this is such an emergency, why has it been deferred for a month? You claim this is an emergency for the immediate preservation of the public peace, health, or safety but it will do the opposite if we have to stop public safety services because of it. I would say to you, 
My wish for my city, and I always say this, this is my city. And my wish for my city of Spokane is that you, the council, would handle the legislative things in the city and that you would let the executive branch do their job. That is my wish. And I would ask you after sitting here tonight and for the last two months, quit deferring. You defer, you defer, look that word up. You do that constantly. And I think if, <laughs> if you really think you should be making the choices that you're doing, I ask every single one of you, why don't you run for mayor? Thank you, Earl. Uh, Rick Bocook, and then after Rick, um, Dave Bilsland, if you want to come down, Dave, and then Crystal Burgett. Uh, regarding that neighborhood, I used to live in that neighborhood, and um, I think about the survey you talked about. That wasn't very many people, and I don't think that neighborhood was represented the way it should have been represented. I think there's a lot of people over there that lack trust in the city. And I don't think they were reached out to strong enough still think that way. Because, like, I remember living in that neighborhood. I lived right by that, um, I guess I can't remember the name of the restaurant there, the new one, Solvent. I used to live right by there. And it's, it's, it's pretty pretty interesting, you know, because I also, because I was raised in Hilliard, so I know about these neighborhoods, and I know that there's people that won't talk to you, so, and that's the part I don't think people are seeing. They reached out to people that they would talk to, but not everybody talked to you, and I think they should have had a, I don't know, they should have maybe went to people's houses, talked to them directly, get the door slammed in your face a little, you know, so you can see having the doors slammed in your face, why people won't say, I don't think that was done enough. I don't think enough doors were slammed in your face. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Dave Bilsland, after Dave, uh, it's Crystal and then Tracy. Good evening, folks. What we're looking at here is changing things to be more sensitive, like putting a police station right across the parking lot from a food bank. You know how many people who are not going to go to that food bank if you put that police station there? Quite a few. Why? Because the police in Spokane scare people, especially poor people. And who goes to food banks? Poor people. Except when you put a police station across the parking lot from it. You're going to make people go further to go to one because this one is going to be poison. Because... There are cops right there. You know how paranoid we are when we're poor about getting busted? You know how much that costs that we don't have? Well, all you're going to do is put people at risk of getting busted. That's the way they see it. That's why I say it's insensitive to put a police station in the same parking lot as a food bank. Let's rethink this. The crime doesn't happen at the food bank, it happens down on spray. Crime, any, how many, what's it take for people to understand that? Thanks, Dave. And then um, Crystal, hello. We've got up to three minutes. Hello, I am Crystal Yosko Somberg, I'm the co founder at Mac Movement, working mother of three, and I'm currently residing in District 2. I'm coming to you today to ask you to pass this ordinance. As a, res a residence in District 2 and a neighbor to the East Central Library, I would like there to be a broader scope and a community input moving forward for citizens, our leaders, and the needed facilities in discussion here today. I'd like for us to collectively decide the outcome of our public spaces now and in the future. Personally, I would love to see the Hispanic Business Professional Association, but I'm open to ideas brought forth by our neighbors. There's more voices here than the police and our mayor. A reminder that they, as well as all of you, work for us, the people. At some point, we have to do more to dismantle the walls between us, and this ordinance is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. 
Tracy, are you going to testify? Okay. And after Tracy is going to be Frida Gandhi and then Laverne Beale. Hello. Um, um, I just, I'm, I'm a grandma again. Um, several, all my kids are grown now and I've been in this town since 86 officially. And so um, this is where I leave my head is home. And I'm planning on moving out to Medical Lake type thing, but um, I do not feel safe in the city. Um, it's very dangerous and a lot of these places are not up to code. So I think we should all live, you know, under Washington, Spokane, Washington, you know, um, together and stuff and um, hopefully at peace. You know, um, I'm 52 years old. I don't plan on going anywhere and neither do my children or my grandchildren now, thank God, because I lost my daddy by 42 and my mom by 52 from drinking and driving. So. I don't like Seattle too much, too big, too fast, you know, so this is home to me. And now I'm a grandma, that's why I push that little car around. I'm gonna, you know, go back to school and, you know, it's a small town to me. I get, I can walk around and walk to Montana back, you know, and stuff, it's, this is home to me. So I just hope everybody can live at peace and, and know that we're in Washington, the US. So thank you for being there for me and my family and militarily speaking, as well as, you know, the law enforcement. So I think, you know, because our food needs to be protected, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. All right, Frida Gandhi, and then Laverne Beale, and then Monica Tittle. Hello, city council members. Hello. I am here in regarding, in regarding the audience 36239. I, just do not understand how we got here. This to me is just absolutely ridiculous. How we are choosing to govern is toxic and it's trickling down to our neighborhoods. It's affecting how we interact as a community with other people. This is ridiculous. The police have been in the library for well over a month now. It hasn't impacted our services. People are still coming to the food bank in record numbers. We can't even keep up. Um, there hasn't been any complaints whatsoever about police being there. And we focus so much on the five to eight officers that are in that building that we are not looking at the bigger picture and the long-term plan for the rest of that entire building. Because the police part gets us all riled up. You know, oh my God, there's police, there are police. But when I talk to people, there are other gaps in services like behavior health. And to address behavior health and public safety, I figured why can't we, why can't there be both there? so that the community members who feel like there needs to be more public safety, more police presence there, and also the families and the children that say, well, we need more behavior help. Why can't we come to some type of agreement to really use that facility to also address gaps in services? I just think that this, this is ridiculous that we've gotten to the point where we no longer talk have conversations about anything anymore. And this makes me sad because I have people coming in the center all the time saying, what, what is the opposition with police? I'm like, I don't have any real answers. At this point, I just feel like the neighborhood, the community members, the police department are now pawns in a political game because all of this has gotten lost, what really, what really matters, what, what really matters to families in that community. It took me four years to gain the trust of that community. Most of you on this council know that they opposed me. They thought I was going to not, not provide services. So, I would never support anything that would put anybody in harm's way. 
because that community trusts me. So please Thanks. think about how we can work together. Yep. Thanks for coming down, Frida. Uh, Laverne Beal, and then Monica Tittle, and then Lori Michaelist. Thank you, Council President, Council Members. My name is Laverne Beal. I'm the Executive Director of ESBA. I'm here I'm here to support the police precinct at its current location, and I oppose this ordinance. And in case you were wondering, I did a study on the crime in the area for 2022 and 2021 for East Central. I divvied it up south, South U District, north of the freeway, south of the freeway. And the south of the freeway has increased 100% in their crime stats for the for the month of July. For June, it increased 45%. I support that, that, the police precinct where it's at. And in case you were wondering, at such a time as this, Spokane should be transforming, be a transforming example. We should be examples of reconciling our current political divide. We should have leaders who look beyond personal stances. Instead, we need leaders who look to protecting our citizens who are in distress and in harm. We need to lead, be led by example. We are in desperate need of strengthening and supporting our citizens and the mayor's office. I am disappointed that these objectives are not discussed or even acknowledged. I am disappointed that our East Central neighborhood is used as a doormat. I am disappointed that East Central's hardworking, hardworking people and businesses are discounted and minimized. I am disappointed that our city council does not acknowledge this. I believe I'm not the only one who is disappointed. Please consider your heart and remember the relationship is more important than politics when you vote tonight. Please don't disappoint East Central at such a time as this. Prove that you care about our relationship. Again, thank you for listening. Now we need action at such a time as this. Thank you, Laverne. Is Monica Tittle here? Not seeing Monica. All right, uh, Lori Michael Bust. And after Lori is Michael Brown and then Bill Hislop. Good evening, City Council. I'm Lori Michael Bust and I've lived in Spokane for 62 years. We have an effective Spokane Police Department. I'm told that their East Central Precinct has been in a dilapidated upstairs location which isn't sufficiently heated or cooled and isn't appropriate for a police precinct. Tonight, our police department is telling us that they favor their new precinct location at its current location in the former East Central Library. I urge you to listen to them. Don't ignore the very police officers and department you should be supporting do their jobs of protecting us all. Give them the resources to do their job. Give them the working conditions that are conducive to protecting our neighborhoods and our citizens. I'm told that the city doesn't have the funding to build a new precinct building. At the same time, we have vacant city-owned facilities which the mayor and the police department say are very suitable for the East Central Precinct. Let's use a former library. Let's use our existing buildings located in the East Central area. Please don't hamstring the police when we already have a building like the former library, which is suitable for the precinct headquarters. I'm very worried about the rise in crime we're seeing in Spokane. It's shocking. Sadly, this ordinance only makes it much harder to solve the city's facility problem. It creates roadblocks to our moving forward. It shows disrespect for our mayor and our police department and for the work they do to protect us all. Having the city council make all the decisions about the location of all major facilities isn't the role of the city council. But more importantly, support for this ordinance shows disrespect for the citizens of Spokane. Why won't you listen? 
why do you put this on the city council agenda, change it in the minutes leading up to tonight's meeting, and then claim there's an emergency that justifies your moving forward with little input or review? It's frustrating to see you act in this manner. It's as if you don't care and you're determined to substitute your judgment for the police and the community. I ask you to vote no on this ordinance. I ask you to vote in favor of the mayor and the police department's recommendations and professional wisdom in keeping the East Central Precinct at the former library. In this case, they know what's better for us all than you. I urge you to listen to them. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming down, Lori. Uh, Michael Brown, and after Michael, Bill Hislop, and then Katara Johnson. Well, I'm here. All right. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, uh, President and the City Council, my good friend Betsy. Um, like Frida said, this is kind of ridiculous. Now, I trump a lot of this what's going on because I've been in this neighborhood, East Central, for 62 years. Born and raised in the same neighborhood. I see all the crime that goes on in the East Central neighborhood. Okay? For instance, I'm going to give you an example. There's been about three shootings over there right across the street from my restaurant, which is Fresh Soul. Now, I'm the executive director of Sarah and Fresh Soul Restaurant. Now, if you haven't been there, shame on you. <laughs> okay? But with that being said, uh, give you an example. They ran a stop sign and tore out part of my restaurant, okay? Tore the whole fence down. If I'd have had people sitting out there, I had closed about a half an hour early. If I'd have been open, it would have killed three people. Okay, the next day, our good mayor, Nadine, called me, Mike, what do you need? I said, I need a four-way stop there. Okay? Two days later, Johnny Perkins called me, city administrator. Michael, we on top of it. I had a four-way stop there in, within a couple of weeks. So I see the crime. You guys don't live there, so you wouldn't know. So you probably don't understand what I'm saying. I need police presence in that neighborhood. I can pick up my phone and call Chief Miner, who I'm so glad is a part of this police department. As Michael, chief. can you still be into the microphone? Okay, There's people I'm listening at I, home. I, I, they I thought my voice you. carries. They want to okay. hear you. Okay. And so I appreciate him so much. I want a police presence there. It's very important because we got people that speed up and down that street going 50, 60 miles an hour. Now, if the city want to make some money, sit there in front of Fresh Soul. Mm -hmm. I called the, the chief. He's had a, he had a, uh, officers out there in two days. They, they called a number of them. Yeah. Now, with that police station there, chief, I want them there more often. And I want the officers to start coming down to the restaurant, visiting me, getting to know what's going on there. It's very important. So I thank you guys for listening to me, but I'm serious. That police station better stay where it's at. And I appreciate you guys for doing that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael, for coming down. Uh, Bill Hislop, Katara Johnson, and then Doug Trudeau. Good evening, council members. I'm Bill Hislop. I've lived in Spokane for a little over 71 years. I've been involved in law enforcement. I've been involved in this community for a long, long time. Uh, I have followed this issue. I have read the ordinance. I have read multiple versions of the ordinance. Even today, I understand that, the, that uh, uh, council president or someone submitted a new version of the ordinance at 9 o'clock last night. I understand that there is a meeting with the mayor today at noon and that revisions were made by council members after that that were not discussed with the mayor. And I understand that we've had at least two or three different versions of this yet today. But yet when you read the ordinance, you talk about public input and you talk about a collaborative and a transparent process. 
And council president, just on Friday, you wrote to a constituent of the city and said it's time to get politics out of this. But in fact, you are absolutely doing the opposite thing. You, the city council, are injecting yourself into a role that is not delegated to you by our city charter. We have a strong mayor form of government that we, the citizens, voted on many years ago. But this council, in a power grab, is seeking to take away authority from the mayor to make decisions. Council members, in all due respect, that is not your role as the legislative body of our city under our city charter. In addition, when you look at this ordinance and you look at the process that you have laid out, there is nothing there stated about utilizing or taking advantage of existing city facilities. All it is is about getting input from the community. And you have heard tonight that there has indeed been substantial input gathered from the community. Now, while you may feel it's not the input you want, nonetheless, there is input. There are other provisions here. Why are you inviting lawsuits by even including the lawsuit section in this ordinance? Why are you asking the City Council's Equity Subcommittee to make recommendations to you about what is the best location for financial sustainability of the location? That is not their expertise or their ability. Why have you laid out absolutes in the criteria here, but nowhere in this ordinance have you said anything about protecting the safety and security of this community. This is a bad piece of legislation. It's being rushed through as an emergency when there is Bill, none. You're, you're well I past ask your time. you to vote against it. Thank you, Bill, for coming down. Katara Johnson, and then Doug Trudeau, and then Eric Olson. Hello, Council President and Council Members. My name is Katara Johnson-Jones. I am one of the chief operating officers at Excelsior Wellness. Excelsior Wellness is committed to offering health services for youth and families alongside the Martin Luther King Junior Center. And of those that whom we serve, we serve many who are also in that neighborhood and the surrounding locations. Providing services in the proposed area would improve access to health care. Excelsior has a long history of collaborating with community stakeholders, and we are committed to continuing to do so. We are willing to continue to be collaborative with the city of Spokane, the MLK Center, and all those committed to the health of our city. If COVID has taught us anything, it is that we are only as healthy as the least healthy in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Katara, for coming down. Doug Trudeau, after Doug, Eric Olson, and then David Sabin. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Council President Beggs, Council Members, my name is Doug Trudeau. I'm President of the East Spokane Business Association. Our members are very concerned about public safety for everyone that lives, works, and visits our, visits our community, which runs from Division Street to Havana, from Trent to 13th Street on the South Hill, and is rep represented by City Council 1 and 2. Our members are experiencing an unprecedented level of crime in 2022, and it's no, no small part due to the illegal camp located on the north side of the freeway near Freya, which is affecting both sides of the freeway as crime statistics over the past three months clearly show density maps on the east central neighborhood show a cluster of criminal activity centered around the illegal camp, which has spilled over the freeway and is most dense on the south side. In fact, in the month of July, the number of incidents on the south side of the freeway have doubled over previous years. Uh, the police precinct, precinct that was located in St. Anne's was no longer safe for use by volunteers, officers, or visitors, and was no, nowhere near ADA compliant. Um, the old East Central building is an ideal location as it has served the community as a public building for many decades. 
The library did not require a change of use designation and would provide a police presence in our neighborhood for years to come. For all these reasons, our members have voted unanimously to endorse the library building as a proper home for the police precinct serving our community. The need for this location for the police precinct is now. The ordinance that you are voting on today and the resolution that you've passed previously suggests that a new police precinct location might not be decided until early 2023 and force the police immediately to move out of the library. Our neighborhood can't afford to wait <clears throat> that long for police protection and crime prevention. Thank you for your time and attention. Please vote against the ordinance. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming down, Doug. Eric Olson and David Staben and then Craig Meidel. Good evening, Council President, Council Members. I'm Major Eric Olson, Spokane Police Department. Thanks for giving me the time to speak. Uh, just brief history. Uh, the old precinct was in a church. It was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to be, we were supposed to be there for six months. That was nine years ago. The building was too small. Our staff couldn't even all work out of the same location. There was heating problems. There were times where we actually had to move the staff out of there because it was 50 degrees inside and you can't have employees working at a desk in 50 degrees. In the summer, the cooling was window air conditioners, and if you put too many plugged in and turned on at the same time, it would blow the circuit. There were extension cords running across the hall. There were electrical issues in addition to that. The building was not conducive to what we need. Plus, you really couldn't find the building. The public, it was not publicly accessible, not readily identifiable by the public to walk in and speak with a police officer. There was no meeting space, and it was unsafe. There was no controlled access, no secured parking, and limited video surveillance. It was an inadequate facility for the police department's South Precinct. The new location is city owned. So there's no purchasing of the building. There's no ongoing rent. It's an on, an, on an arterial. It's easy to find and identify and has high community visibility. It has large, it's a large open space that will be used for precinct staff COPS and potentially mental health care partnerships. We will be looking at how we structure. It's a big open room right now. And as we restructure our patrol division, as we've communicated with the council prior, we'll be looking at housing different officers there and potentially having roll calls, which this large of a space would be able to facilitate. The improvements made to this property would be something that the city would own because it's a city owned building. It's directly and easily accessible for ADA compliance. We actually have COPS volunteers that would not volunteer because they weren't able to get up and down the stairs. But I think one of the easiest and biggest ports that I would like to speak to is the fact that the community supports it. This gives the police department opportunity to be next to a community hub. It gives us face-to-face -face interaction with the public, and that time gives us the ability to build relationships, and that relationships really equate to trust. And that's what we're looking to build with our police department and our community is to trust and to make that community safer. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. David Staben, after David, Craig Meidel, and then Jack Archer. Good evening. My name is David Staben. I am the South Precinct Lieutenant. I was, uh, uh, took up that job in June of 2021 in the old St. Anne's Church uh, nunnery. Um, everything that uh, Major Olson said about that location is accurate. During the time that I was there for uh, around a year, I'm not aware of one citizen ever coming in to the old South Precinct uh, at, the, at the church. I moved the South Precinct um, to the old library at the direction of uh, the executive staff. Um, I was asked to come here and speak as to why that should stay at the library specifically. I don't have an opinion on that. And the reason I don't have an opinion on that is because the South Precinct is a team. It's not a building or location. It's a team that works under my command and now under the command of Captain Matt Coles. Um, there are five officers in, under our command, only five. Three of them are neighborhood resource officers. Most of the neighborhoods are south of the freeway because we have everything south of the river except for the downtown core. The other two are detectives. Um, prior to our move, one of the officers worked uh, out of Cop Southeast up at Lincoln Heights and the other one out of Cop Southwest down on 3rd, close to Brown's Edition. 
So it's important as a leader to have all of my team in one location. I don't have any other needs than office spaces, a meeting room, and a bathroom. We go out in the field to do uh, uh, the great uh, majority of our work, and the rest of the time uh, we're in the office at our desk writing up the paperwork. Um, so I, I, that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks for coming down. Craig Meidel and then Jack Archer. Good evening, Council President, members of the, the City Council, Craig Miles, Spokane PD. I, I will absolutely not be redundant. I, I just do want to point out a couple things. One is, um, I know you heard from Michael Brown, um, who owns Fresh Soul. You've heard from Frida Gandhi. Also, Larry of Larry's Barbershop. Um, all three pillars in that community. Uh, they're very vested in the community. They're very well-known in the community. And uh, they have a, probably more contacts in one week than, than we would have in a year with that community. And you heard their support. And I think it's fair to say that they represent what the overwhelming majority of the community is going to want just because of the sheer nature of where their businesses are located and the type of businesses they have and the types of people that they talk with. And, and so I will acknowledge there's always going to be uh, people that may not want us around. If you're looking to victimize someone else, you're not going to want us around. Um, and there may be a few other reasons that people won't want us around, but but we're there to connect with the community. Um, I, I think uh, Larry of Larry's Barbershop said it, said it better. We have police presence in other communities. Why don't we have one in East Central? Um, and so I just want to reinforce that that we did we have spoken to who I would call uh, many of the pillars in that community, and they have overwhelmingly said without hesitation they're supportive of the precinct there. So I would ask you to to ensure that uh, whatever happens, we get to keep our precinct where it's at. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Jack Archer. Hello. Uh, my name is Jack Archer. I lived in District 2, and I am testifying in favor of this emergency ordinance. I'm here in two capacities. First, as an organizer for the Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane and Spokane Community Against Racism, two organizations that were actually requested by members of the East Central community to bring attention to the process around this issue. I actually got this shirt from one such community member, and for the visually impaired, it says, Rebuild East Central, Nothing About Us Without Us. Uh, it's a gift from someone who lives in, who is invested in this community. I'm also here as a voter in District 2. I remember when the old library became open. I remember the excitement of this great new resource coming open in the district. And I remember the confusion that suffused the whole process around it as organizations submitted blueprints and letters of support only to discover via press conference that the Woodward administration had already blessed a plan to give the location to the SPD. There was no communication. Also late to know was my own council member who far from being unengaged had publicly requested multiple times a conversation with Mayor Woodward and got crickets. That doesn't build relationships and claiming to value conversation and relationships while stonewalling council members who literally live in the neighborhood they're discussing is, well, hypocrisy. <laughs> Ultimately, many people – I'm skipping a piece here. Pardon me as I read here. Uh, I found that whole process to be disrespectful to the council and disrespectful to me as a voter who voted for my council member to represent what happens in the district where I live. And as a voter in D2, it disturbs me that my elected representative could be so easily cut out of conversations directly affecting the place in which she personally lives. Ultimately, many people who should have had a voice in the fate of the old library felt uh, left out or unheard. And I know because over 50 of them showed up to do different demonstrations outside the library to say so. As for the extensive community engagement, people keep saying, quote, the community supports the district, but the community is large, and no one who has testified, myself included, can speak for the majority because we simply do not know. The thought exchange uh, that was conducted, only a third of those responses can be verified as coming from within that district at all, and the word cloud and the responses that I got to view personally when the data was pulled show that while police appeared in a large majority of responses, it came in a variety of contexts, some for or against it, but ultimately none of that is the point. This ordinance isn't about public safety. It's not public safety legislation. It's about community resource management, which is precisely what I voted for my council representative to legislate. Whatever the old library becomes, behavioral health, a cultural center, or a police station, Spokane deserves an inclusive, collaborative, and transparent process for deciding the fate of community resources, and that is what this ordinance gives us. It brings us back into the conversation instead of pronouncements coming from a mayor's office. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Jack. 
And that's the end of um, public comment. I'm going to start us off because I'm one of the sponsors of the ordinance just to set the table of what the intent of the ordinance is and is not. Under the city charter, the city council does set policy for the city and it does do the budgeting and it passes laws and this is a law so it's right within our wheelhouse of what we're up to. And for me, um, I also was excited when um, we heard that uh, the city was going to be able to take back control of uh, this library building. It's a big open space uh, and it's right on a campus where people get a lot of services, direct services. Um, we started out with a process of saying, let's, let's have a community process. There were several requests to the administration to uh, open up an RFP or RFQ process that went ignored. Um, not too many months ago, the mayor announced at a public press conference there that the city council would make the final decision on it. Shortly after that, I drafted a resolution that would set out that process. It uh, directed the city to uh, publish a request for qualifications for whoever wanted to operate there, including the police department, and then had a community review process where we would have an open house at the vacant library and you could see storyboards and people could give input about multiple choices. Instead of are you for the police or against the police or for the Hispanic Business Association or not or Excelsior or not or Chaz or not or Multicare or not, you could put all those together in one place and people could look and say what would be best. And you could invite the entire East Central neighborhood, not just the few blocks around that area and ask where do you want these services and what services do you want? That was the idea. That was at a, I believe, Monday public safety committee meeting. The next day, the order was given uh, with short notice to uh, move uh, police officers from St. Anne's on the north side of the freeway to the south side of the freeway. Uh, and that caused a lot of uproar in the community and um, distress and dissatisfaction. Uh, this ordinance was meant to bring a open process to those type of facility locations decisions for police stations, for fire stations, for big water projects, things that impact the community. Um, I personally, when I got the data from the police chief of crime, it looked pretty clear to me that the vast majority of crime occurred north of the freeway, not south. And as many of you know, the freeway is a, a pretty major barrier between uh, police officers getting to the north side. Um, at the time, we understood that it was patrol officers were gonna be working out of there, but that is not the case. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson and I visited uh, the library on Friday and took a tour. And just as Lieutenant Staben said, there was three NRO officers, two of them who were pulled out of the neighborhoods where they were working, uh, right with the communities they were working with to be there, and two detectives, and, uh, and then Lieutenant Staben, and then now we have a new captain there. So it's not the people who are patrolling and doing that type of work uh, in that area other than the East Central NRO. So it was a little different than I think some people thought. And really, my idea on this is that the most that could happen, the most benefit, is not that it's either or police or behavioral health. It's just that you could have both. In the Northeast Community Center library that we vacated, we are renting that to MultiCare. They're gonna pay uh, fair market rent well over $100,000 a year uh, to operate low-income behavioral health services, which the community really wants. And my sense is East Central could really benefit from that as well, especially at a location where people are already getting services. You take just a portion of that rent and you could provide some excellent police offices uh, and on an arterial, visible, making it easier for police to respond right to the community and walk around businesses where crime is happening and be that deterrent that is so important. So you could have both for the price of one building instead of choosing between one or the other. And on the day that it was announced that uh, the uh, police were moving in, there was some discussion about working with Excelsior and I uh, think Excelsior does great work, so I called up the CEO and I said, would you ever locate people getting mental health treatment right in the same place where police officers were coming in and out? And he told me, no, you might have it on the same campus, but you wouldn't want it at the same building because many people are triggered uh, through no fault of their own nor the fault of the police. 
And so I just, and I went and I looked, and it didn't look like the building was going to be set up well. When I was there visiting, uh, city construction workers were there getting ready to create space for Department of Corrections to supervise felons there. Since then, when we raised the alarm and said, do you really want to do that, city? We confirmed, no, they're not going to do that. But on that day, that's what they were working on that plan to do that. So this just tells everybody, take a breath, don't rush into anything, go through a process and figure out how to do things. And that's what this is meant to do going forward, not just for this facility, but for other similar facilities. And with that, I'll open it up to the rest of council. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. So this has never been an either or conversation, not for one second. It's always been a both conversation. Uh, and in fact, I also had a conversation with the CEO of Excelsior and heard the exact opposite of what the council president just said. So <clears throat> what the truth of that is, I don't know. I wish he was here to speak for himself. That would be really helpful. Um, but unfortunately he's not. So a uh, couple of things I have heard for a very long time, predating my time on the council, but especially in the three years I've been on this council, this idea that our public safety woes, our crime, et cetera, is the fault of the mayor. Regardless of who the mayor is, it's, it's the mayor's doing. That's her wheelhouse or his, and that's their job. It's not council's. I certainly have a very different view of that. I think council plays a significant role, should play a significant role in keeping our community safe. Um, but I think, and I'm not sure that the rest of council has thought, uh, thought about this, but I think once this passes, council owns it. Council owns crime because now this council is responsible for citing police precincts, determining where we're gonna deploy those resources. It's on this city council. If crime goes up somewhere and we don't respond, that's no longer an administrative issue, it's a city council issue as a result of this ordinance. And I don't know that people have thought about that. And I think that there is an important aspect of keeping this city council accountable from here on out once this passes. Make sure this city council hears from you if your neighborhood, especially in East Central, but anywhere, if you're getting increased crime, you're feeling the impacts, you can look at this ordinance and say, well, the city council is responsible for deploying these resources to keep us safe. So let's go talk to city council. And I think from here on out, that's gonna be the mantra. It should be, it certainly should be. But we know the neighborhood, East Central neighborhood supports this. Many of the community members were here today uh, who are very involved in the East Central neighborhood, have been for, for years as we've heard, and they are very supportive of additional uh, police resources in that neighborhood and not necessarily north of the freeway or on Sprague per se but in the building that the city owns and can utilize immediately and has been if this passes tomorrow likely or once it's affirmatively in law there will be a lawsuit against the city that would probably result in the police being kicked out of the library so what happens then they're back in a dilapidated hole without heat, without, you know, without uh, uh, AC, I'm certainly not gonna support that. Hell no, uh, not for one second. And that's gonna be the outcome of this as a result of putting in the language that encourages lawsuits against the city. I believe that. Um, second, there is a, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, that we have allocated this uh, review to the city council's equity subcommittee. Well, I voted against seating that subcommittee because it is not an equitable subcommittee, despite its name. Uh, it has very little representation from the northeast part of our community. And frankly, I would, if this passes, I would call on um, uh, reopening the appointments to that because we are now going to need to recruit experts in financial sustainability. We need people who really understand uh, crime and the impacts to uh, various neighborhoods because now they're responsible for making these location uh, reviews. That was not what one of those people signed up for when they joined that subcommittee. This should be in the wheelhouse of the plan commission. That would make a heck of a lot more sense and was probably the way it was originally written before uh, it became politicized. Um, so to me, I think um, there's just so much here. The, the, the community has not been allowed to, to really engage on this as much as they should have been. But we have, and I think the mayor pointed this out, but we have very much excluded one very big area, and that is courthouses or municipal justice centers. The city council has allocated, or is, is seeking to allocate around 15 million for a new building 
That doesn't include the uh, uh, renovations that would go into that or anything else. And that is gonna be in District 1, not too far from where we're talking about, but in District 1, it is gonna have holding cells. It is gonna have all kinds of, of services and things there um, that will be high impact on that neighborhood. And there has not been one, not one, not one neighbor who's been asked, how do you feel about this going in next door to you? Because there hasn't been a public engagement process because, well, the majority hasn't politicized that one, but this one has been politicized. And so I'm just really frustrated over this. We need police resources in East Central. We have seen a huge increase in crime as a result of the camp, but we have also seen crime, and perhaps related, perhaps not, but we've seen crime rising in the area around uh, the, the community center. And we know the community center supports uh, putting the, um, uh, the police precinct there. And so the last thing I just want to read here is something from uh, not a constituent, somebody who lives about a block from the location. And this is some, some stuff that they shared with us today. And I just think it's really, really important that you all have a chance to hear it. Since moving into this neighborhood, there have been two drive-by shootings ending in death on our street. One victim was a teenage boy. The other was a father with children. Earlier this year, my wife witnessed a drug deal taking place in front of our neighbor's house. Uh, the person walked through our neighbor's front gate, through their yard, out their back gate, and our neighbors have two young children at home. Last year, two cars drove past our house shooting at each other. My wife grabbed our youngest daughter from the couch, threw her to the floor, jumped on top of her. An officer later showed up and looked for bullet ho holes in the home. Uh, two years ago, while I was at work, someone tried opening the front door of our house in broad daylight while my wife was alone with our daughters. Fortunately, the door was locked. She called me in a panic and also called law enforcement. The man kept going from house to house in our neighborhood, attempting to enter people's homes. Fortunately, there was an officer close by who was dispatched and found the man. He was arrested and booked on a warrant. Several years ago, we witnessed a man crawl out from under our neighbor's front porch early in the morning, looking through multiple windows. Uh, we have witnessed a lot of foot traffic and drug activity from the two houses down from us, uh, and not to mention the many auto accidents. We were relieved to hear uh, of the police precinct, but we are discouraged that our city council is against it. We need police resources in that neighborhood. It's getting dangerous. We've allowed it to get worse, and we have an opportunity to keep those police resources there today. And so I will be very strongly opposing this ordinance. Other council commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. I'm in support of this. First of all, we want clarity. East Central is not receiving any more policing at this location than it had at St. Anne's. We are not receiving any more resources. The, police, the policing you had before is what you have today. So that is a false narrative that you are safer today than what you were yesterday. Same number of officers, same deployed to the neighborhood, same responses. There are over 4,000 people who live in the East Central neighborhood. We talked about thought exchange and we were trying to get ideas. But on thought exchange, a lot of that came from outside of East Central. As a matter of fact, other neighborhood councils have written letters in support of the precinct in East Central. And they're on the other side of the river or way up on the South Hill, nowhere in the neighborhood. Don't come to the neighborhood, don't live in the neighborhood, don't shop in the neighborhood. So it's like those voices, I'm not minimizing, but I really want to hear from the people who live there. We do have some well-respected leaders from that neighborhood, but again, there are over 4,000 people. We know East Central is a healthcare desert. It is something that's been needed for a long time. This was a great opportunity to explore what that could look like in addition to a precinct. Now, I'm challenged because we've been asking, well, where's the plan? And I'm challenged because if St. Anne's was such a terrible location, why hadn't they come to us before now and said, council, we need help. There are other city-owned buildings on Sprague, but since we don't know what the plan is, we don't really know what the resources are that's needed, how big of a, how big of a footprint that they need, to really accommodate what they're trying to do in East Central. Also, officers can be doing community policing from wherever they're at. 
doesn't matter the location. And if that hasn't been going on in East Central, shame on the police department. There's nothing that keeps officers from engaging with the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, there has been a resource officer up until recently located in the East Central Community Center. I don't know how much time they spent there, but there was a dedicated office for community engagement. So putting a building in a neighborhood does not equate to community policing. That is truly relationship building. And the officer who spoke, it's about the team and how they work within the community. So again, I had asked for a independent survey so it wouldn't be skewed, not from uh, the administration side, not from people that I know that we engage because Spokane Police Department had said to me they had done an informal survey around East Central. And I asked Major Olson some time back, could you find out what that was like? I haven't heard back. So I was asking, how many homes did you go to? What were the questions asked? Because we all know surveys can be skewed based on the questions. Did the officers show up in their uniform? And really, did East Central ever have the opportunity to dream about what could be there beside a precinct? Yes, we want public safety. Absolutely, we do. And we want to provide a resource in a location that meets their needs. But that neighborhood, for the first time, had the opportunity to dream about what else could be in the community, whether it's health care or other nonprofits. I was open to letting the community decide. And I have said many times, if it came back a precinct, great. But right now, all the information is so anecdotal that we really don't have any true data to know what that neighborhood wants. So this is why I am supporting this. And I still support us doing a independent survey with a third party so all the biases are taken out of it as we go forward to really get a good grasp because East Central is growing. There are lots of things going to be happening down there. It's an amazing neighborhood. And that is the only way for Spokane to grow is to go east. So with that in mind, let's not rush to just put the police precinct there. And truly, what is the highest and best use of that space? Councilmember Stratton. Oh, go ahead. After that, I want to read something. <laughs> no, you go. Okay. I just want to finish this off. Councilmember Catcart wrote, uh, read something from a constituent. Uh, I want to read something also. Um, Even though I live on the South Hill, I occasionally visit the East Central. Plus, I have friends who live in that area. I want them to have a say in whether there is a police precinct close to where they live. It is noteworthy that our mostly white police department can feel like an occupying force in neighborhoods of color, especially when residents are not asked for their opinion. As a white person, I have never experienced a police precinct moving into my neighborhood. Rather, I live among neighbors. There are some shops close by, but that enriches my experience. Councilmember Stratton. So I just want to add that this has not been easy. Um, and the reason it hasn't been easy is that I respect every council member sitting up here representing their districts. And that is one of the most, that is the most important thing we do is we represent the people in our district who trusted us to represent them. Um, I want to say that during this whole crazy process, that wasn't, I don't feel very open and wasn't well communicated. Um, I was getting emails from my constituents in the third district um, sympathizing with the East Central neighborhood simply because they didn't feel there was enough outreach to those living in those homes in East Central. 
Um, and I found that interesting. I know West Central would probably love a police precinct. Um, we haven't had those conversations in a while, but it, it really is all about representing those, those people that live in your district. And, and I was um, amazed at the amount of um, feedback I got from third district, especially those living in West Central, saying even with all the crime and the issues that we've had in West Central, we would want a sit-down community process to um, house a precinct. I just got done in a meeting with some um, representatives from Audubon Downriver in Northwest Spokane um, who have put together a community plan for the Shadle Center area. And that was a community plan that took a little bit of time and they have a, they have a whole plan for that district and I'm proud of that because I can look at that and I can say everyday people living in that district, those neighborhoods had a piece of this. They had a part of this that they could walk away and feel proud of and know that they had people on city council helping them um, promote making their neighborhoods better and improving services in their neighborhoods. So. This is a really hard one, and I agree with every one of you that have said this is a political issue. It is, and it shouldn't be. Um, I've always said people in my district don't care who I voted for for president. They care that their streets are safe, that you know their parks are clean, that their streets are fixed. Um, we shouldn't be jumping into these kinds of issues with a political um, uh, tone or a political um, desire because the people that suffer are the ones that are caught in the middle and those are the people that live in the district and need the services or want the services but don't necessarily want them right across from their community center. So this is not easy and um, I think everybody's a, a little bit to blame because the communication wasn't um, I don't think clear and forthcoming, but the, the thing I am most disappointed in is that the two individuals who represent that district were, in my opinion, left out of some of the decision making, left out of the, um, the uh, press conference that day. It was, to me, a political power play that we should all be ashamed of and um, I hope that we don't put ourselves through that again because the people that suffer again are those people that live in the district, those people that will need police um, and those people that will need health care and services and mental health treatment, all of that that we could provide in our neighborhoods. To simply jump into this decision, the way that it was done and the hoopla and the, the press conference and um, two of the district representatives not at that, at that event, to me was um, unprofessional and insensitive. So um, I'm gonna support this just because maybe it's a lesson we all learned that either we start talking to each other and you know meet our communities where they're at in their neighborhoods to talk about these things um, or you know, we're going to keep getting in trouble like this, but I'm going to support it and hope that we can do better in the future. But let this be a lesson that what's important are people and the needs of the community you represent, regardless of your politics. I don't care how big your ego is. We're there to serve people in our district and we're there to help them get what they want and the services um, that they desire. And we failed miserably at this one. So I'm done. Sorry. Councilmember Bingle. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Cathcart, how many city council people represent East Central? Four. Four. Four, not two, four, right? So there is a there is half in District Two and half is in the Northeast. So there are four uh, city council representatives. Uh, two of us are in favor. Um, of this of this proposal and so um, 
I just think it's important because one of the narratives has been that the city council representatives were, were not fully engaged. And I'm not saying all of us were fully engaged and there couldn't have been something better, but it keeps saying that their city council representatives have been left out and uh, that you know they haven't been heard and they haven't been listened to. It is important to understand East Central has four. four. It is the one lucky neighborhood in the city of Spokane that has four city council representatives. Um, I do want to talk about, uh, oh, I apologize, yeah. I'll let you correct that later, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I apologize, but, uh, but this one is lucky that it has four. Uh, so, and I do want to talk about representing the people living in, in your district because, uh, again, I understand how important that is and I think it's great. And I also think that it shouldn't be political, but it is. And the reason why I know that this is political and we keep blaming the mayor and we keep saying it's administration and they didn't let us in and all this kind of stuff. I do want to talk about this um, ordinance. I think a lot of people have hit the merits on it. I just want to point out some, some process inconsistencies um, and some substantial inconsistencies in this. This, um, this ordinance should be titled uh, Citing Some Basic City Facilities. Uh, because it's not all basic city facilities, and I know that we changed it for that reason uh, because, um, uh, you know, legal had suggested it. But, again, the reason why we know it's political is because we didn't include facilities that city council is pushing for. We didn't include the Municipal Justice Center. We didn't, which is something that, again, without public input, we are rushing to purchase. We approved $5 million for the purchase um, of that facility from ARPA dollars. We're going to be selling buildings to buy that building. Uh, we have even discussed eminent domaining a building next to it without much of an, an open and public process on that to fit the needs of the Municipal Justice Center. Um, one of the things that we've, we've heard tonight is that, uh, you know, over 600 responses on a thought exchange is not that many people. National polls that are run that are determining the temperature of the nation are about 1,000 respondents on average, 1,000. And we had, we had well over 600 people respond to this. I mean, that's, that's pretty good for one neighborhood when you're looking at a national poll being 1,000. I mean, we're pretty darn close there. And then when we look at of the uh, you know, respondents that came in, well over 50% of them were people who supported police or a precinct there. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating for one thing or the other. I'm just saying the things that we are blaming on the administration, the things that we are up in arms about are things that we should really be looking in the mirror at uh, in, in the same ways. Uh, another reason why we know it's political is because the date outlined in this, uh, in this ordinance specifically about, goes back to capture this one decision. It wasn't in, in, uh, to capture any other decision but this one. We wanted to make sure that the date outline was to capture the decision uh, when that went in. Uh, this is an emergency ordinance. Uh, an emergency ordinance requires five votes to pass. Anything in his emergency to this council insofar as we don't like it, right? We didn't like the decision the mayor made. It's an emergency. We have to change something. Um, and uh, and with, with five votes, uh, you know, again, the cynic looking at, uh, at this council ideologically might just say the majority can, in an emergency, do whatever they want because they have five votes. Uh, we're talking about, again, public input. There have been multiple versions presented uh, to council in the last couple of days. There's absolutely no way we can get adequate public input on the final document that we are going to be discussing tonight with multiple versions. We got one last night, roughly nine o'clock. We got another one today at 145, and the meeting is at six. There's absolutely no way the public can read and understand and digest exactly what is going to be going into law in that amount of time. We've been talking about, you know, the freeway being a major barrier. We asked the police very directly, is this a major barrier? And they said, no. Uh, you know, we've been talking, uh, you know, about the plan and uh, Councilwoman uh, Wilkerson and I spoke about this earlier and I, uh, as we were, as we we're going through this process, I remember that we were just given a presentation on the restructuring of the police and how they're going to be more effective in the community and how it's going to work and this facility is going to be an important step for us and an important place for us to be able to actually operate patrols um, out of that area. And I've happily been working with the, with the police and others on, uh, on a plan to substantially increase the size of the police force because uh, we cannot provide the adequate level of service that every neighborhood uh, you know, deserves at this point with, with the amount of policing that we have. And so I, again, look forward to us supporting that. 
when we're talking about community policing, Michael Brown in his testimony says that he called the police chief and there was a response there the next day that his, his needs were being handled. That is one person being represented for sure. But uh, when we're talking about community policing, I believe that our police are making efforts in that area. Um, and again, back on the public input, we had the community assembly rep, the neighborhood council, the business association, the head of the, uh, of the East Central Community Center, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center, and the thought exchange. We had a significant amount of public outreach that happened. This was not something rushed. This was not something that happened. It happened over the course of more than six months. And so while this is not, certainly not a unanimous decision, there has been overwhelming support for, for this decision um, in, the, in the old East Central um, Library. Um, when, it, when it comes to decisions that we're making at the city, we rarely have that, that level of support from that diverse a range of organizations um, happening uh, in, in a neighborhood. Um, for me, the biggest problem with this is that we didn't like a decision the mayor made. That's clear, that's evident. Um, and because of that, we put together an emergency ordinance um, that wasn't developed fully and given to the public, um, even given to council members until 1.45 today. And so uh, I just, I, I more have a problem with the process because uh, the things that we're condemning the mayor for are, are the very things that we're doing to ourselves. I'm a big fan of making sure that we have our own house in order before we start throwing stones at others. And uh, I would really suggest to the council, I, if you couldn't tell, I'm not supporting this. And uh, I, I would encourage the rest of us to, um, uh, to not support it because, again, it feels, it feels very two-faced in the accusations that we're lobbying and not looking in the mirror. So I will not be supporting tonight. Councilmember Tapone. Yep. Um, I will be supporting this ordinance, and I understand a lot of the concern about the public safety in the neighborhood. And this ordinance doesn't do anything to hurt uh, the neighborhood or prevent law enforcement from working in the neighborhood and continuing to do outreach in the neighborhood. Uh, some of the reasons that I'm supporting this ordinance is we know the outreach process is flawed. Uh, we know thought exchange is not a perfect tool. It is a tool, but it is not perfect. Uh, it doesn't allow us to see the bigger picture, just like we heard what is the bigger picture for the use of the building and the neighborhood. Um, why don't we do more outreach? There was no public meeting had. The mayor did not have a town hall in the MLK Center, in the library, to ask people what to do there. Instead, it was all online. Not everyone even has access to the internet to be able to give that input. So why be afraid of more information? Um, I'm not sure exactly, personally, how a police precinct makes the neighborhoods a lot safer. Since the downtown precinct has gone in over a year ago in downtown, crime has still gone up downtown. So the building itself will not do anything. We need more resources. Second, there's nothing in the city charter that reserves this power to the mayor. This is just a false argument. Uh, like Council President Beggs pointed out, Council has the power to pass ordinances. That's what we're doing. That's why we have checks and balances. This is an ordinance. Also in the city charter, if you look at section or Article 4, Section 37, the Procurement of Public Works, Goods, and Services, it says, subject to the general laws of the state of Washington, the city council shall, by ordinance, regulate the manner in which the city contracts for public works, personal services, and acquisition and disposition of property. This is a property, and we're saying what we should do with the building that is under the city council's purview. In section 24, it says the mayor has the following duties and powers. The, uh, section A, the duty to see that all laws and ordinances are faithfully enforced and the law and order are maintained in the city. So we have to have this uh, stipulation in here that allows a member of the public to sue the city because the mayor has a track record of not following her duties and her powers of not following by the ordinances of the city. So that's why we have to have a public oversight because they're not following the laws of the city. Um, we know that when it comes to the cooling and warming centers, they have not been opened by requirement from the city charter or by ordinance. Last, uh, I believe that the mayor is more concerned about putting on a show instead of doing her job of governing. Once again, she's coming to city council to attack us instead of doing the job out in public uh, and improving public safety. If the mayor had kept to her word and worked with council, we wouldn't be here in this place in the first place. This law, this ordinance would not even be here and being created. There was a lot of hoopla, like council member Stratton said, a press conference, uh, 
more events, directing, probably directing city staff to come here and testify, coming and testifying herself. So um, the mayor has been in charge for the last couple of years, and we've seen an increase in crime. So it's about putting on a show and looking tough instead of doing the job and governing and making substantive changes. So for that reason, I will be up of supporting this ordinance. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I just, we haven't actually acquired or disposed of any property, so I don't think that charter actually applies to this situation because it's our own property. We've maintained it. We haven't sold it or purchased it. So I don't think that that applies. But also, we've had cooling centers. We've, I, we've had those open, extended hours. We've followed the laws there. Uh, so I, I would dis disagree that, that there has been no following of laws and that this requires a special ordinance um, that, by the way, the mayor is here addressing and not out in the community as a result of this ordinance being here. So that's why she's here right now. I, I just want to point out really quick that Council Member Stratton and I were out there when it was five degrees at Camp Hope um, and there was no warming center and that's a violation of the ordinance directly. Where, where is that in our code that we have to have a cooling center at every location? A, a no. warming center. There was no warming center opened when it was five degrees outside. At, but at the library there was. No, no, I'm talking about the winter. Warming center. Oh, you're talking about the warming center. Yes, in the okay. winter. I, I can't speak to that, I, I don't recall at this point, but, but if you're talking cooling, we did have those open. Nope, I've been referring to the warming center. Councilmember Bingle. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just, I just can't let the, the statement stand that the mayor is here for show. I am so sorry, I just cannot let that stand. Um, you said that the mayor once again is coming to city council to attack us. We are attacking her and her administration and her decisions in this ordinance. And so she's not here attacking us. She's here defending herself first off. Second off, her administration at her direction has been working incredibly hard to make this city better. And to say that she is here to do it for show is one of the most disrespectful things I've ever heard. Any other comments? Well, yes. Yes. Councilmember Kinnear. Thank you. Uh, first of all, whew. I was not supportive of the first draft of this ordinance. And I was not supportive because it did not follow the comprehensive plan. We have a comprehensive plan. We're required to follow it. It asks that we, uh, it tells us actually that we need to utilize a process for locating essential public facilities that incorporates different levels of public purview review, depending on facility scale and location. And right now we don't have a process. I don't care if there is a police precinct or not. I think it'd be great if there was, but whatever the public decides. And I, the police know I am supportive of you all. I've been supportive when I was a uh, public safety chair. I still am but we need to follow a process and we need to follow our comprehensive plan. So I asked for some of these changes and I'm gonna ask for one more tonight based on a conversation with city legal. I would like to make an amendment if I can find it, um, that we uh, eliminate paragraph D of section 1205062 and that's the part about um, mm -hmm. filing suit. So I'm gonna keep my, that's all I wanna say about why I'm gonna support this. I wasn't going to, enough changes were made so that it is saying that we are gonna follow our comprehensive plan. And if you go back and read the comprehensive plan, you will see that certain things, certain facilities require a process, not a muni court, okay? So I would like to move that we do eliminate that paragraph D, section 1205.062, um, as requested by city legal. Second. Could you just read it? <sighs> You're such a bother sometimes. Um, I could. I'm trying to find it too. Let's see if I can, f I, yeah. Is that basic it's, city facility? Yeah. No. In, um, Jacoby, can you, where are you? It's the nothing in city law. Yeah, do you have it right there? I, I think this might be the, the 9 p.m. version and not the 145, so just so it is, Just to be out. clear, that 9 p.m. version was sent to City Legal weeks ago. They sent it to the mayor's office 9 p.m. last night, just to be clear on the 9 p.m. Do you want to either pass it or read so, it? So, yeah, here. 
So it's at the bottom of that page that's at top. So essentially, let's see. Nothing in city law prevents a Spokane resident withstanding who believes that the city has not fully complied with the section prior to the city providing services at a basic so a city facility from seeking injunctive relief at Superior Court. It pr it's the same one. Yeah, because it's got the 90 day thing. I'll take that out. Um, under the authority of this ordinance to stop delivery of services and or funding until compliance with the section has been achieved. Thanks. That is my okay, that's amendment. motion. It's been second. Second. I told City Legal I had no objection to that. That paragraph had already been changed. It didn't grant a right of action. It just simply says that there's nothing in the law that prevents community members from exercising their legal rights. So, but I have no issue with it. So I'm fine with it. So did we get a second? Yes, yeah, second. Yeah. Okay. So, Any, Council President, yeah. can you clarify what, why you wanted it in the, in the first place? Um, I just uh, wanted to make sure that uh, nobody thought that we were limiting people's rights to go to court. So stating that, but I don't think there is. And city legal convinced me that people have the rights. If they don't think the city is following its law, they can go to court. So they convinced me we don't need it. Um, I think my, under my sense is that they were uncomfortable even mentioning lawsuits as, as if that would somehow, if, if you didn't mention it, people wouldn't <laughs> know about it, but I didn't think it was critical to it. But there's still the option that people can... There, there always is the option. Yeah. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. <laughs> we heard so, that yes. from our city attorney yes. recently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like keeping it in there and making it clear and making it clear to the administration that there's a liability if we don't follow this ordinance. And again, it's the mayor's duty to follow ordinances and enforce them. Well, I think if it brings us closer to an agreement, I would, I would agree with Council Member Kinnear to strike it. So does it truly bring us closer to an agreement or is this just a little negotiated point here? Well, either way, <laughs> it's a win. It makes city legal happy for sure. I understand city legal, but I understand citizens as well, so. Yeah. I think everybody knows that they can, as I said, anybody can sue anybody for anything. That's not, that, it happens all the time. Let's not open the door. All right, any other conversation about the amendment to remove paragraph D? And just, just for clarity, it's the entirety of paragraph D through 2022? Yes. Okay. All right, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 Okay. Amendment passes, so no long, D is no longer in there. Any other commentary? Can I make clarity about District 2? Yes. District 2 has two representative. The north side of Sprague chose to be part of District 1. When citizens vote for District 2, that is south of the freeway or Sprague, East Central is in District 2. It is not in District 1. And the two council members here, I don't believe, really have standing to represent that community center. If I'm wrong or somebody finds something in the law, please let me know. But the citizens who vote in District 2 I think that's their understanding as well. So just to clear, you, you said East Central, but you meant East Central Community Center. Yes, the East the, Central the, Community Center. The actual Center. campus. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Council Member Bingle. I, I think that's a fine standard. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been applied in almost any way when we're talking about Camp Hope. In no way have Councilman Cathcart and I been invited to those meetings or been represented in those meetings. And so if that wants to be our standard, I'm totally fine with it. But it has been inconsistently applied, again, to the detriment of District 1. And so if this is what we want, I'm, I'm totally good with it. Councilmember Cathcart. Well, also, uh, when you say nobody, they, they chose to be in District 2, that's actually not how the redistricting process works. I mean, they, they might have chose to buy a house in an area that's District 2, but there's a redistricting process that decides where the districts are, are outlined. Mm -hmm. So that's not, 
a choice of the citizens okay. or of us. It's completely separate um, from, from us. So just to clarify that. All right, any further commentary on the merits of the overall ordinance? I'd like to make a motion to defer indefinitely. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All those in. So I, yeah, I have a question. Okay. You wanted to defer indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's been, here's one of my frustrations. Mm -hmm. There are two ordinances out there and nobody could come together to turn it into one ordinance we could all live with. Mm -hmm. So are we gonna play the game of, we're gonna defer this one for ever or for indefinitely, and then we're gonna bring this other one back because that's just not gonna be, that's not a good use of anybody's time. Well, again, this, this happened on the sit and lie. Councilman Cathcart and I brought this up. We thought it was really good legislation and got deferred indefinitely. That's, that was my comment. All right, so there's a motion on the floor to defer this ordinance indefinitely. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 I think that was two to five, so that motion fails. All right, merits of this ordinance, any other comments? I just want to say one, just again, to summarize some of the things that I already Excuse heard. Excuse me, Council, did we vote on D? Did we get yes. to that? Yeah. We did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just make sure we got that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to again emphasize that this is not a question of whether there is a precinct in East Central neighborhood. That is not the question. The question is which building is it in. There has been a precinct in East Central for many years, just on the north side of the freeway, uh, and there will be a precinct in East Central regardless of this vote. It's only a question of is there a public process about which building would be best for this precinct. And so I, again, I've been on the council six and a half years and throughout my time, various people on the council, we have consistently increased the police budget by millions of dollars every year. We've added dozens and dozens of officers, uh, often at, over the objection of the administration when we passed the public safety levy um, to do that. So, this has been going on and the council has funded, funded and funded police and supported them. They deserve to have good offices. The question in my mind on this, that this ordinance was birthed from was, should we take a building that's not designed for a police precinct that could be a mental health or low income medical clinic and then use the funds from that rent to pay for a first class uh, police precinct? For the last nine years over two administrations, they have not come forward asking for better office space for our officers in that. And I'm committed to getting them that space and making it better, but also making it better for the community. I, my own thought was we should have had the process of just have four or five different proposals, have everyone look at them in person, what it would look like, and choose between the proposals and which buildings are where, which buildings might be good for a police precinct. So as opposed to it's not an all or nothing, it's not you're with us or you're against us or you're for the police or not or for the mayor or not. That is unfortunate how it's been and I've been trying to get us back to what would be the best use of a building uh, that was providing civic social services uh, and is there something better than a police precinct and especially if we could replicate the police precinct in the offices that would work better. Again, my last vision of being there is there were these five desks spread throughout a 6,000 sprawling building and it just was a very lonely place and not very effective. And so it's not whether or not they need a good place, it's what would be appropriate. And if we could have a clinic and we could have a police precinct all in the East Central neighborhood, not necessarily in the same building, that would be the win. That's what inspired this ordinance, and I urge you to support it. Prepare to vote. All right, so that passes five to two. We're going to have uh, a hearing briefly, and then we'll take a short break before we get to open forum. H1A hearing on vacation of portions of Boy Scout Way and Gardner Avenue between Washington Street and Howard Street is requested by the Spokane Public Facilities District. 
H1B first reading ordinance C36260 vacating portions of Boy Scout Way and Gardner Avenue between Washington Street and Howard Street. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. Eldon, you want to come down and just preview it briefly? Good evening. What we're talking about is the actual vacation of portions of Gardner Avenue and Boy Scout Way, which is basically part of the parking lot today over there at the arena site. And the public facilities district is trying to actually build a new stadium there. And they've requested vacation of the east 35 feet of Gardner Avenue, which is just east of Howard Street. Here, I got it, Eldon. Yeah, it's trying to eliminate that piece of the picture. Yep. There's there the west 25 feet of Boy Scout Way. And originally we vacated what's in between the magenta on there years ago. So we're just now asking to vacate, like I say, the west 42 feet of, or the east uh, 42 feet of Gardner and the west 25 feet of Boy Scout Way. There are no city utilities in that street. Uh, they were, they're in the process of being relocated. So we're not requesting any easements to be located in there. Uh, originally we had requested the uh, payment for the right of way, which totaled about $47,104. The uh, public facilities district and the school district actually sent a letter to us requesting waiver of that fee based on the public benefit of the project. That was condition number four in our recommended conditions of approval. We would recommend elimination of that requirement based on their public benefit that they've represented. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Eldon, do we need to bring a motion on the public benefit exception or is that included in your? It's, I would recommend you just eliminate condition number four okay. in there, which uh, requires it today. Is, upon there, council is there a motion to eliminate condition number four? So Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, condition four is eliminated. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, and Eldon, I so apologize if I had thought a little more clearly, I would have had you do your hearing before the last matter, but thanks for <laughs> being here. There's no, um, the only public comment was Tracy Blum, who I believe left quite a while ago. So uh, is there any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Can we take a 10 minute break. We'll be back really promptly by 8.30 in your seats, hopefully, and we'll uh, finish up the night. felt like you were looking right at me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you <may have> <laughs> they are hot.
All right, we're back in session. Uh, we have open forum still tonight. We have quite a few people signed up. I don't know if they're all here, but I'll do what I normally do, which is call out three people and invite other people to uh, come up to these front two chairs. The first person um, on the list is Catherine Mallon, um, followed by Bill Hagee or William Hagee, and then Rick Bocook. Is Council President, yeah. could I just make a really quick point of personal privilege? Yeah. So I just wanted to, and I, I should have done this before the break, but I, I just forgot. I just wanted to say to my wife, uh, a big I love you. Today's our anniversary, our Ooh. second year anniversary. <laughs> Just, just in case she's not putting our kiddo to bed right now and she's watching, just wanted to say I love you and happy anniversary and I'll be home hopefully in about an hour or so. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Wonderful. All right. All right. Catherine. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, council members. Um, if you can't see this, someone very kindly said, oh, you wanted to show a picture of your daughter. Mm -hmm. Very kind. Um, no. That's a very enthusiastic wife at the age of 19. Um, and I wanted to show it to you because she's sitting, I'm sitting, on every, you can see in that picture, everything my husband and I own. It's a five by nine, eight rug. The curtains in the background we did purchase. And our one folding chair is also in the picture. And I'm smiling because I'm very happy. And I wanted you to know that because um, you're about to purchase the Quality Inn near the home of our, where we live. And that makes me sad. Um, Councilman Cardhart said the council should own crime earlier tonight. And I want you to remember that because it's coming to my neighborhood on the West Hills. And Councilman Stratton said, we should meet our neighbors where they're at. Come live in my house, please, mm -hmm. where I'm putting in a security system, an electric gate. The police chief said earlier that a sugar packet of fentanyl would kill I think he said 500 people. There's supposed to be a good neighborhood agreement in this no barriers um, shelter that's going in. And if they can't do their drugs on their property, then by definition, they've got to do it on mine. Either my public property that I'm paying taxes for or my own property, which is eight tenths of a mile away from the Quality Inn which you gave me no notice and no voice in. This is a family neighborhood, a neighborhood with only single family homes and apartments, no stop and shops, no place to get a pop, only one grocery store anywhere near, and that's two miles away. I'm asking you, a military family for 30 years who happily kept you safe, moved 14 times in 14 years. We've been home for seven, been in our home for five. Our little slice of heaven finally, after keeping you safe for 30 years in a heavily military neighborhood Catherine. of retirees, and active duty. We're at the end of your time. Thank Th you. Thanks so much for coming down. Uh, William Hagee, after William is Rick Bocook, and then Glenn Stockwell. Uh, welcome. Welcome, uh, Council President, Council Members, thank you for having me. Uh, I, uh, West Hills resident, West Hills Neighborhood Council Chair, uh, we've since had a couple resignations here following the influx of opposition about the uh, Catalyst Project as well as uh, Empire Health 
Tonight, we asked the city council to approve a motion directing city staff not to take any actions for proposed homeless shelters or permanent low barrier housing options in the West Hills neighborhood until the city has further developed a plan or reviewed proposed homeless shelter housing locations, potential adverse impacts, and explore many mitigation measures with the city commissioners so the city's made better not worse by actions that our government is taking now in regards to homeless shelters and so that resident residential communities and our expectations for a better Spokane are not destroyed and uh, further on behalf of council to call upon commissioners to hold and reopen the proposed projects and developments in West Hills and to further review those for discussion uh, public health and safety has been a concern in our community for quite some time now in what's elevated most recently to a critical level community-wide in what is leading to further lawlessness, violence, and crime. And uh, we had an interesting, so I have a second here, uh, experience uh, last week. A woman arrived in the uh, uh, neighborhood clothed and dressed in men's clothing. And there was a bag of clothes in close proximity. She was wandering around, didn't know where she was at, had no idea what her name was. She was unable to speak. She didn't have any response. I found a number of these bags over the past year that look like personal belongings, clothing, hygiene products. She's uh, later, um, after about seven hours, she was recovered by AMR. Um, and I'm largely concerned with public health and safety. It's, we have a large influx of this type of behavior. So please take that into consideration. And thank you for your time. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Rick, Bo Cook, then Glenn Stockwell, and then Dave Bilsland. I tell you that I, um, the last couple months, you know, I drive a bus for, with people. These are people that are autistic, people that have the ADD, the, the children out here that have problems, problem children, you know, and I work with a nonprofit where we help these children out. And so three days a week, Glass Park, we have 40 to 60 kids that we give them entertainment because they don't have hardly any places to go. This is not done by the government. This is community here. Well, so 7.30 in the morning, when I go to Glass Park, See, one of my jobs is to walk through the park to look for, guess what? I find foils with fentanyl traces on them, needles, see? So what I do, and then the parks department comes in there and they help clean this stuff up. And once in a while I get the privilege of meeting the drug addicts. And when I, and I don't, I'm not mean to them. I just flat out because they look at me I don't know why they call me an OG, maybe because I'm older. But anyway, I talk to them directly, and I, and I tell them, I says, you know, I can't stop you from your drug problem. See, I, that's what I tell them. I says, I know what's going on, because here they are, you know, they're getting ready to smoke it. And I let them know, clean up your mess. And that's as best as I can do, but I'm doing it. One of the problems that people have when they come across somebody that's a drug addict, the first thing they want to do is get mad at them, scold them, whatever it is. Big mistake, because these people, they need help. Now, the helping state, they're in stages. You can't necessarily get them to a drug program, but they're still in stages. Talking to them as people is one of the main things that's happening. So when, you hear, when I hear the stories about Okay, you're going to move all these homeless people up here to this area, and there's going to be drug addicts, and there are going to be drug problems. Okay, there are still people, and it's going to happen, and there's not too much you can do about it. But you can try to work on trying to heal them in stages. That's one of the things that I'm working with kids, and I tell them flat out, there's kids coming to this park. You won't be here. You will be gone. And they listen to me, and they leave. Because if they don't leave, then we have grounds to get the police there. Because we're talking about the safety and protection of children. 
but they will listen. And because they listen, you know, they also won't be attacking you or doing things because you're talking to them like human beings that have problems. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Rick. Uh, Glenn Stockwell, then Dave Bisland, Bilsland, excuse me, and then Joshua, I'm not sure the last name, but it starts with an SC. Hello, my name is Glenn Stockwell, as, as the president pointed out. I'm the chairman of Washington State Economic Development. Mm -hmm. Economic development is not red, nor is it blue, it's green. This city here, uh, council, is uh, generally uh, controlled by the Democrats. And the Democrat Party of Roosevelt and, and uh, John F. Kennedy did wonderful things for our country. And uh, you have the opportunity to take one of Roosevelt's projects that has been setting on the table. It was, it was his largest project. It was only half completed. This body right here of Democrats could do exactly what took place 90 years ago when Clarence Martin, who was then the mayor of Cheney, Washington, became the governor of Washington State, the 11th governor, and he reached out to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and they brought this wonderful project in of putting in the Grand Coulee Dam and everything else. After the war, it took them roughly six years to finish that project. There, right now, as uh, President Beggs has given me a, a, a meeting time frame uh, next month, and I'm hoping to get him to, to help the state bring this largest project in U.S. history to, to Washington State. Right now, as we're sitting here, if you can imagine $1.2 trillion has been sitting on the table, at the federal table, since August 10th of 2021. And the reason it's not gone is there's a patriotic Democrat by the name of Joe Manchin that has stopped him from spending that money. I asked President Beggs if he ran his law firm on positive cash flow. You have to have money to put projects in. I, one project I put in years ago, and I noticed it was when uh, Councilman Bingles and uh, Cathcart were born, actually. It was a long time ago. And I uh, went out and got $107 million of private funding to put in the largest project in Adams County's history. I was actually in this room before any of you were here. So, uh, I helped with your long haul, getting rid of your solid waste and et cetera. Uh, I was hoping that you would be willing, the one thing Clarence Martin did, he worked in a bipartisan fashion. When you go to the governor's uh, office and they have that long table, half of it was Republican and half of it was Democrat. He demanded it. Mm -hmm. When he farmed, he worked with jackasses and he knew exactly what a stubborn old mule was. So anyway, I'm hoping that you would help bring this project to Spokane County where it originated and help the state. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks for coming down, Glenn. Uh, Dave Bilsland, are you out there? There you are. And Joshua after that. And then looks like Michaela B. I'm not quite getting the last name on that either. All right. Yes, I was hiding in plain sight. <laughs> You're usually right back there. I would like to do a program where... STA fares are eliminated. We can do this by doing a signature campaign. The signature campaign would actually bring everybody together because who doesn't want free bus rides? The reason we need to do a signature campaign is to get the funding for this. Yes, it is about the money. I propose we go on <clears throat> the ballot to raise STA's 0.2% sales tax to 0.3% as allowed by laws dating back to the 80s. We could provide the STA with a lot more money. They could eliminate fares. They could bring in some new routes. How about if we accommodate swing shift and run the buses a little later? 
I had to pass on jobs because I could not work swing shift because I couldn't get home. Okay, and this has been a problem for a long time. If we can fix this, maybe we can get more people to work on swing shift. These are the people that get off at 1 o'clock, get off at 12.30, get off at midnight. You can't catch a bus then. This needs to be changed. And a way to do it is to increase the funding. And in doing so, you can also decrease fares, which is a very positive thing for everybody. Talk about a democratic process. Everybody gets free buses. And I'm not Oprah. OK, the reason I want to do this signature process, though, is how much it's going to bring people together. I've organized these things in the past. I've worked many of them. Not only are we going to get people involved in the process for free buses, we're also going to get them working together and learning the process. We're going to be registering people to vote. We're going to bring the whole process into focus. Here's how we do it, and let's do it. So if anybody's interested, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be putting something together. I'll try to get at worst a Facebook page going, and we can start there. We're not going to get it on the ballot until probably the next uh, 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 general or maybe the, the primary. I'm not sure. But that's the time frame we're looking at. And so what I want to do is get enough signatures that I have every vote necessary already there and take it in and send that many signatures down. I think our city can get together and do this and get free buses and better buses. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Joshua, if you want to... No, I just said thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Joshua, if you come in and just introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I can't quite read your name. And then Michaela after that, and then Beth Zamat. Uh, my name is Joshua Scowden, uh, representing the West Hills neighborhood. And uh, good evening, uh, council members and President Beggs. Um, so, director of the rescue mission, uh, his name is Robert Farmer. And he, his definition of low barrier, which I'm pretty sure is across the board, uh, pretty, pretty much the same, is no ID required no criminal screening, no background checks, uh, no sobriety. Um, and you can be a current drug user, uh, methamphetamine, uh, crack, uh, fentanyl, anything. It could be anything. Um, you could be a sexual offender, uh, child molester, rapist, burglar. Um, been convicted of multiple violent offenses. And to me, that is unacceptable. I do understand uh, the gentleman with the overalls. I, I get it. Um, they're people. But what determines the kind of people we are are the decisions we make. And the type of neighborhood we have right now is in jeopardy. And I don't think it's OK. There's real estate, you know, commercial real estate. Um, that's been up for lease, up for sale for years. I mean, drive around, NAI Black, all over the place. They've been trying to lease out spaces for ever, right? I see the same vacant areas, uh, vacant lots, vacant buildings. And I just don't, don't see how um, it's not clear as day that you want to keep uh, people that are in that stage um, of their life. They can improve, they can get better, but offering something to them that would harm so many other people. You can help people without hurting other people. And I think that's the biggest takeaway. You don't have to hurt people uh, to help other people. And I think that's uh, pretty much wraps it up for me, so. Okay. Thanks for coming down, Joshua. Yep. As Michaela, here. Hi, Michaela. See if we can bend that microphone down a little bit. So you can, after Michaela is Beth Zamont, and then looks like Derek Zamont. Hi. Hi, Michaela. Hi, my name is Michaela. 
I live in Sunset Hills. I will be the West Hills kid representative. So far, all the kids I've talked to are not for Camp Hope people coming to live in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Michaela. I hope to see you again. Uh, Beth Zamat and then Derek Zamat and then Sarah Hunter. It's Sant. And I oh. apologize, Derek will not be here. He's okay. uh, getting our child um, the chicken nuggets that she so desperately craves. <laughs> so. <laughs> Glad I could make someone smile. I, f I felt that in my soul. <laughs> Didn't we all? Um, so I'm also here for the West Hills project. And without naming names, I know for a fact that at least one council member has a wife and daughters. And I know that everyone here has a mother, and I'm sure that that said council member would do anything to keep their female family members safe. But when it comes to my daughter, or the daughters, wives, girlfriends, and mothers of the West Hills neighborhood, in the words of Antoine Donson, hide your wife, hide your kids, because they rape in everybody up in here. It's not your problem, it's now my problem. Everyone involved in the deliberately furtive Catalyst Project knows that crimes against women will skyrocket. Cam and Riley Construction warned you about it. And what are they going to do? I happen to come into possession of an email that tells you what they plan to do, and it's about as useful as nipples on a chicken. Legally toothless agreements that ask transients to play by the rules and a small collection of mall cops. But don't worry. When those people break the rules, and they will, they be trespassed from the quality inn and into my yard. And I don't know about anybody else, but a handful of Paul Blarts patrolling the neighborhood does not safety make. DSP can't even pick up trash under the Cedar Street viaduct because the homeless people there are attacking them with knives, pipes, and cudgels. And you want that in my neighborhood. Okay. I don't understand why you think it's acceptable for me to be at risk, for my daughter to be at risk, for wives, mothers, girlfriends, families. Why is my life so worthless to you or that of my child when the women of the West Hills neighborhood are raped and assaulted? We certainly know who to thank, and we will. You've made your position clear. Your families matter more than ours, and don't think for a single second that we're going to forget the day that you told the women of West Hills that they don't matter. Thanks for coming down, Beth. Uh, next is Sarah Hunter, then Christine Quinn, and then John Vowell. Hi, I'm Sarah from West Hills. Welcome, Sarah. Yes. So I wanted to share a story with you guys. Uh, February 6, 2021, I drove home after a 12-hour shift working as a nurse. After I, I passed the Rosars, and you can either go left to Vinegar Flats or go right over the Sunset Bridge. I went right. A gentleman jumped out in front of me and threw a suitcase underneath my truck. He proceeded to jump on my vehicle and beat the windshield in with a skateboard. I was nearly six months pregnant. I finally was able to move my vehicle when he got off to the side so I could run, off the, run to drive the vehicle without actually hurting him in the process. He went on to beat two other passengers behind me. He, is, he was arrested that night and convicted. But what I want to ask you, Beggs, was when you came up with this plan for the Quality Inn, did you also come up with a comprehensive plan to protect my family? Because without that, we're looking at taxation without representation. And with that, I would like the council to now reopen this and to include all the county commissioners, the neighborhood councils, so we all can come up with a real comprehensive plan that works for everyone, because this simply does not work for us. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Sarah. Uh, Christine, and then John Val, and then Karen John, looks like. Hi, I'm Christine Quinn. I live in West Hills, and I was just going to say, we will take that police precinct. We're going to need it. Thanks, Christine. Is John Val here? Am I getting that right? Okay. Kieran, John? And after, I'm not saying if I'm saying your name right, so please. Uh, Kieran, John. Okay. 
And then Crystal Burgett. I know it's been a long afternoon for me. Uh, so I can only imagine it's been a long afternoon for you. But if I could just have your eyes on me for a minute, just so you can hear me. <clears throat> Hello, council members. I'm so happy to hear the council wants a more significant role in keeping our community safe. Because the safety of my community is in serious jeopardy, and we desperately need your help. <clears throat> I am here, sorry. I am here to speak on multiple proposed homeless shelters set to be built within our neighborhood, West Hills. Two years ago, we bought our home in the West Hills with the intent to plant our roots and grow our family. Our daughter is nine years old, and, my, <clears throat> and I am currently six months pregnant with another little girl. My husband and I dumped everything we had into our recent home purchase in order to invest in our children's future. Last week, our neighbor's group messaged us, alarmed by an obviously intoxicated and incoherent non-resident located at Whittier Park. This is the very same place our children play and wait to take the bus to go to school. It is already the case that we can't walk safely outside of our neighborhood towards downtown. <clears throat> or shop in our closest grocery store, and that's, within, that's with the current homeless situation. It is clearly evident by looking at Camp Hope's neighborhood and surrounding businesses that these shelters currently in the works will not only devalue our homes and, de and drive out businesses, but most importantly, rob our children of being able to safely play outside of our own homes. I believe that the less fortunate absolutely need and deserve help, but not at the expense of the safety of our children. There is no reason we can't set up these camps, shelters, and centers away from disrupting our children and their right to have a safe environment. We all fear that the multiple proposed shelters will run, ruin this hardworking, taxpaying neighborhood. As a mom, all I ask is, would you want these shelters and pallet homes and centers right next to your home? Anyone? Isn't it obvious that the most responsible thing to do is to locate these projects away from neighborhoods? Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming down. Is Crystal still here? And after Crystal is Monica Tittle and Tracy Blum, who's I think gone, and so then Justin O'Connell. Hi, Crystal. Hi, uh, Crystal Yasko Zomberget, uh, co founder at Mac Movement, Spokane, Washington. Oh, yeah, it was a wacky night, <laughs> just saying. Um, first of all, I wanted to publicly say that we at Mac Movement asked for two minutes with Nadine every Monday because since 2017, we have stood out here and she has walked by and never acknowledged us, never taken a moment to see us, never taken a moment to observe or conversate with the people that we serve. And so we have very, been very polite about it, those records of it. Um, and I would like to bridge the gap with her and it's a convenient time for both of us. So I wanted to tell you all of you that we're asking for that outside of City Hall. And I feel like it's fair for the people that we serve. So um, I also wanted to, I'm here from Cool Spokane as well. Um, we are tired. We're barely getting a break this week with the cooler weather. Um, and absolutely still have not received support from the city of Spokane after meeting with Mr. Perkins. We're hopeful that after this meeting they will be funding a couple cooling centers because they have not had them open. Um, and so we're still waiting for that support. So I just want to encourage you all to please do what you can there. Um, Cool Spokane groups have ran five cooling stations for a total of 18 days so far, around $6,000 in cash donations from 75 individual donors, over 100 individual volunteers, over 10,000 bottles of water and thousands of sandwiches and snacks have been passed out. 
A group estimate total cost of labor and supplies is upwards of $20,000. We've been saving lives this summer together without the help from the city. So I'm hoping you guys will step up. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Um, Monica, are you still here? There you are. Come on down. After Monica, it's going to be Justin O'Connell and then Paula Dusty, I believe. Hi, how are you tonight? Great. I understand everyone's worried about having homeless shelter, well, quality in housing, ho housing homeless people. I was homeless for five years on these streets. I know them very well, unfortunately. But I can tell you right now that I went from someone that had never been homeless to someone that thought I was unworthy of ever having a home or a roof over my own head. And the fact that we can house sex offenders downtown around daycares quicker than we can home a house put a homeless person in the house is ridiculous. You take the trauma away from the person that's going through the trauma at the time, and I guarantee you're gonna see an addiction drop, you're gonna see vandalism drop, you're gonna see a lot of the crimes that we have around here right now drop. These people think that they are worthless. They've been browbeat and just destroyed. I've been spit on, I've had things thrown at me that you don't even wanna know about. I've been raped. I've been beaten. I have seen people raped and beaten. You live in constant fear. And you think that the only people that are supposed to be there for you aren't there. They turn their backs on you. Yeah, you're gonna sit there and you're gonna come at them hard. You're damn right, pardon my French. I understand why people are nervous about these people going into this quality in. But everyone, if a sex offender can be housed, by God, a homeless person can be too. And it's ridiculous. People don't stop and think about that. Judge not, lest ye be judged first. Matthew 7. I was homeless. I have been sober for eight years. Two months and 13 days. Didn't turn me into another addict because I chose to not be one. There are people out here that have mental illness that cannot handle what has happened to them. I have family in Spokane. They wouldn't even look at me. They would turn and walk the other way like I didn't exist. It's time that we take, you know, we teach the public, we need to teach everyone that you don't know what a person's going through while they're homeless. You don't. Don't. Judge someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Just because, you know, we're, they're going to house people there. You might be surprised just how much crime stops. Things like that. Because you're getting people off the streets. Giving them a reason to actually feel something about themselves and think they're worth something. That's what we need to do. I apologize for yelling. Thank, thanks for coming down and thanks for bringing Jackson. Appreciate it. Uh, Justin O'Connell. And after Justin is Paula... And then I'm going to try to fit in Dave M. if he's still on the phone. Thank you, Council, for hearing us out. And thank you, Council President, for your help last week. The City Council has the best customer service in the country, I think. So, you know, I'm here at, to send a warning from Central Planning. As you know, I work with Central Planning, and we have a little situation developing in, in Houston. I understand that, you know, the cost of living is out of control everywhere. And even city employees here, you know, they're this close to possibly living uh, in their cars, from what I'm hearing. And it might be tempting to start looking to Houston for uh, solutions. We're, we're having that in Dallas right now. The writers there, the journalists, they're saying maybe the housing crisis solution is in Houston. And, and at Central Planning, we can't really have that, you know. We've been trying to get Houston to implement zoning uh, forever. Basically, 1948, 1962, 1993, 2021, zoning, zoning. And they keep saying no. It's kind of like the fluoride thing here. We keep bringing it to the voters, and they say no. There, you know, we tell them we're going to save their neighborhoods, and they still vote no on the zoning. Mm -hmm. That's knowing that it has to go to a vote in the first place. Nonetheless, Hispanics voted 58% against zoning in Houston, and 71% of low-income uh, black individuals voted against it there. And these numbers are very concerning uh, for us at Central Planning, so that's why I'm here tonight, just to kind of dissuade you from, if you're looking to maybe, you know, look to Houston for solutions, just not to do that. Now, you know, Houston relies on the, the market and the so-called price system, which I haven't read too much into, but uh, 
they, they do have a lot of ordinances, but no land use policies, and that's just something that we can't really have. You know, at central planning, we say people don't want to build new houses next to existing commercial and apartment buildings. But then in, in Houston, they're doing it, which kind of makes us look a little bad. Industry is voluntarily building near all near rail lines or highways. Businesses are ending up on thoroughfares. Uh, you know, businesses that are in the quiet neighborhoods, they go out of business generally unless they serve that neighborhood. Gas stations are, are busy competing uh, on intersections. And it, basically, like, the Houston system is just a big thorn in our side. Uh, in single family zoning, home prices are stable when it's a nice neighborhood. And uh, you know, all around Houston, we just have examples of uh, kind of uh, lack of land use restrictions, um, working kind of just ending up like in the rest of uh, the country, which does have zoning in basically every major city. And uh, you know, housing prices are 6% lower in Houston. And this is something that I think people are starting to look at increasingly. So like I said, I was sent here by Central Planning to warn you against looking towards any such solutions of maybe you know, limiting zoning. You know, although I work for Central Planning, I do dabble on the weekends in libertarian philosophy. It's just kind of a kind of know your enemy uh, better than your friends type situation. And you know, the libertarians, they're even kind of okay with this quid pro quo kind of uh, relationships with developers, maybe help out uh, lowering uh, you know, cost of living or letting them build certain things with exceptions. And so I just gotta say that uh, you know, that's something that we don't wanna encourage the central planning either. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Justin. Uh, Paula, and I'm, if you could, Introduce yourself again. I'm just not reading your last name. And after Paula, we're going to do Dave M by phone if he's there, and then Kathleen Sharp. Paula Duffy. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I know some city council members believe that the no and low barrier shelters that are targeting the West Hills neighborhood is a done deal. And we in the Western Hills neighborhood believe this not to be true, even though the city and Catholic charities have certainly look like they've colluded to uh, fund millions of dollars to Catholic charities, perhaps at the expense of other programs, and certainly transparency and process. If the city council chooses to ignore our neighborhood concerns and totally ignore our neighborhood council, then it's up to me and my 2,000 plus neighbors who live in the West Hills and our adjacent neighborhoods in the west side of town to keep our uh, West Hills from becoming a dumping ground for crime and drug use. And this is why we were outside tonight protesting uh, on the corner there by City Hall. And we will be back uh, protesting again in the future and uh, certainly attending future city council, city council meetings. Uh, we want to, we're here tonight to give voice to our neighbors and all of the neighborhoods in Spokane that want a voice for a future quality of life. And so again, I ask each one of you, if transient housing is such a boon for residential neighborhoods, which neighborhood uh, that you live in is gonna accept pallet homes and other types of transient housings on your street? West Hills, our vote matters. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. And Dave M, I'm checking to see if you're on the phone still. Yes, Dave, thanks for uh, waiting, uh, you have up to three minutes. Oh, I hit star three. Oh, you're there. Okay, Dave, welcome. I'm, I'm here. Uh, first off, uh, Councilman uh, Cathcart, happy anniversary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to congratulate the, uh, the rest of the council on your consistency to disappoint uh, from water towers to water crimes, from Alvey to abortion, from cops to crosswalks. You never fail to disappoint. You do not listen to the citizens of Spokane. It's time for the citizens, the taxpayers, and all Spokane residents to wake up and realize this council doesn't represent you. <clears throat> That's all I've got for tonight. Have a good night. All right. Thanks, Dave. And uh, now we have Kathleen Sharp. After Kathleen, uh, Mr. Hemphill signed up, but I'm pretty sure he's gone. And so uh, Drea Gallardo and then Linda Peterson, it looks like. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, I'm here to voice my concern regarding Catholic Charities opening a low barrier homeless shelter in the Quality Inn um, very near my home. 
I believe the shelter will be detrimental to the community economically, but more importantly, to the safety of families. Specifically, um, as a mom of a five-year-old daughter, I'm concerned regarding substance abuse. Um, the Catholic Charity website states that individuals with substance abuse problems will be allowed in the facility. The site also states individuals will not be allowed to use substances on site. It seems logical to believe these individuals with substance abuse problems and addictions will be leaving the facility and going out into the streets of our community to use and procure drugs. When I spoke with Catholic Charities, one thing I was told is that they will be relying on community members to be the eyes and ears of the community, seeing and reporting, reporting these activities. They are essentially acknowledging that yes, I will be seeing drug use and sales in my area because of this shelter and I should deal with it. I'm distressed to think my community will be in this situation. And I ask the city council to help prevent this homeless facility from opening in the Quality Inn and to look for a less residential area. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Andrea Gallardo, are you here? There she is. After Drea, it's gonna be Linda Peterson and then Joseph Carson. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, but are you listening? Are the people in the positions of power that make a change for a better future, are you listening to the people that you serve? Are you putting the people over profit? We are either working together or we're working against each other. I'm the co-founder of Mac Movement, that's music, art, and creativity movement. And we've been outside of the city hall um, since 2017 doing free food with the side of free speech because that's our right, our, our freedom of speech. And um, you guys are deciding stuff here. So we try to make it a comfortable place for people to come and speak. So you guys are hearing from the people. I'm very proud of M Monica for speaking earlier. It takes, you know, a lot to speak and tell your story. You know, I'm a descendant of the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene tribe, and I've said it before. Uh, you're here, and I'm, I've said it here before, and I'm gonna say it again. This is not our way. The indigenous, indigenous people have always been welcoming and would share all that we had that's always been our way, ever since the first settlers first set foot on our land. And I think they have forgotten that they are guests on this land. It's not no one's to keep, it's all of our responsibility to protect. And our people want, <laughs> um, I wanna give a shout out to all the volunteers with the uh, Cool Spokane. Um, we put in a lot of hours for the community and um, with no help. And um, it just, it takes all of us working together. We should prepare better, you know, we're in the north, Northwest with threatening heat and threatening winters and these are lives, lives at stake. And we're, you know, literally been saving lives with the cooling stations. It's not that hard for us to, to figure these things out together, and I just hope that we do. And I also, um, I've asked before if we could put open forum in the beginning of the meetings, because you know a lot of us are, are moms and stuff and parents, and it just takes a lot to be here all the way to the end, because it's you know like the lady had to go for chicken nuggets, and <laughs> you know I want some chicken nuggets too. Um, <laughs> Uh, all jokes aside, though, you know, I appreciate everybody's time and just hope that we can work together and so solve some of these issues for the future's sake. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Linda Peterson. Is Linda here? Not seeing Linda. Joseph Carson. Not seeing Joseph. Tanya Comstock. After Tanya is Dale Brees. Hey, 
<laughs> um, I think that um, the people right now that are looking for shelters right now, they they should like go look at um, at the stores that are empty, you know, and make those into shelters too. You know, the 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 city needs to build more shelters for for homeless people, and and they need to build some for children too that are out there too, and they and they need to make um, more buses too for them. You know, and like if they stay out late at night too, and they and they need to teach. The kids too about uh, about drugs in schools too. Thank you, Tanya, for coming down. Oh yeah. Uh, next is Dale Brees, but I don't see Dale. He was here. And then the next, I'm just trying to read this. I think it's a Sandy with a V. Oh, Sandy. Sorry about that. And then after Sandy, it looks like Antoine Vallone and then Jay Sharp. Thanks for your time. Welcome. Uh, I haven't got anything better to say than I did last Monday. I talked to Catholic charities. Um, everywhere, everywhere I go, I can't find much information on this, on our homeless shelter and the quality in. And I talked to, uh, I mean, what, we, it's the biggest cancer that was downtown for years. Nobody would go downtown because of all the homeless and particularly Charity House. It was the one that contributed to it the most. And then you get, a, a, I guess, a grant of money and you have 30 days to spend it and you've got to spend it. So you put it up in this neighborhood. Is that a solution where you take you know, crime and drugs and everything else and take it out of downtown so you guys don't have to look at it anymore and you're going to stick it, what, four or five miles up so that we have to look at it. Is that your solution? I, I, it's terrible. It's terrible. And, and Catholic Charities, you know, they, they, um, I, I asked them what they're going to do. I mean, it's a low, they have no curfew. It's every bit of criminal and drug addict that was downtown is now up there. There's no, no, no curfew. Um, they, uh, excuse me. There's no, there's no curfew. Um, they can go wherever they want to, uh, to buy drugs, whatever. Um, and it's just not going to work in our neighborhood. Um, you, they're going to get three meals a day. Um, and they don't have no curfew at night, so off they go down through our neighborhoods, and it, it's uh, we're going to get all the crime that you guys got downtown and have for years, and now you're going to put it with us. Why did you do that? Why, why is why is that happening to us? You think we're going to sit there and just say, "Oh yeah, no, no way," um, you know? It's just it's just not right. The process wasn't good. You snuck it in on us. Um, uh, to start with, we didn't even know about it until three weeks ago. And when you guys, when everybody knew about it, they wouldn't, still wouldn't tell us so that the owner of the place could make a few more bucks so we wouldn't have to tell his employees about it and they would quit. You know, it's, uh, and now we've got pallets going in down there at, uh, at the intersection. Um, it's unbelievable. We need, to, we need to back up and go through this whole thing again. Nobody wants this up there, and I hope you don't put it there. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Sandy. And then, again, I might, not sure if I'm reading this, but I think it's Antone Vallone, maybe? Anything like that? All right, how about Jay Sharp? And clear handwriting, too, so thank you. Well, well, I signed up online. All right, I would like to state my objection to the sale of the Quality Inn to Catholic Charities to use a low barrier homeless shelter. We have a housing issue in Spokane and there has been positive movement in the West Hills neighborhood to build and continue to build apartment complexes to help this shortage. 
With the acquisition of the Quality Inn to be used as a homeless shelter, these projects are now put on hold due to the negative impact the homeless shelter will cause for the neighborhood. With a housing shortage, this will continue to limit houses and construction jobs. The West Hills community needs positive growth like apartment complexes. Catholic Charities is not proposing positive growth and has not been transparent in their intentions in this transaction or the transaction on Lower Sunset Hill closer to the bridge. People say homelessness isn't a choice, but on most days the Union Gospel Mission has 40 beds available. Homelessness must be a choice for some as they are not seeking out these available resources. As stated before, this is a low barrier housing project, meaning if a person is using drugs or convicted of drug use, they can still come to live there. This is provided that they do not use drugs on the property. When asked about drug use in the community, Catholic Charities responded on the phone call that they would rely on the neighbors in the West Hills community to police those activities. Rob McCann, president of Catholic Charities, who profits from running these shelters with a salary well over $300,000, lives 8.2 miles away from where he is proposing this shelter. My 76-year-old mother lives 2,611 feet. My 76 and 73-year-old in-laws who have a 14-year-old disabled grandson living with them live 2,968 feet. And my family, including my five-year-old daughter, live about 3,700 feet from this proposed shelter. My family and my neighbors did not sign up to police this proposed shelter. Obviously, Rob McCann didn't sign up either as he is miles away in the safety of his South Hill neighborhood. My neighbors and I already need to police our area from transients, abandoning mobile homes, vehicles, and literally camping in our yards. I asked the city council to not approve the change to use of the 4301 West Sunset use as a homeless shelter. This area has no services, is a residential community with no industry to support jobs, it's two miles away from the closest grocery store, and has no health care facilities. The only thing this is going on for it is it's eight miles away from Rob McCann's residence, and the Catholic Charities believes that the neighbors will police the activities of their residents. My wife, my five-year-old daughter, and myself are not police officers, but we are being asked to be, and we do not want to be placed in a position where we have to defend our families due to Catholic Charities. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Jay. That brings us to the end of Open Forum. Thanks, everyone, for your patience and participation. I want a special shout out to staff. We've got several council member staff. We've got the TV5 people. And we've got a police officer there in the back as well. Thanks for your work and service. Uh, please take care of yourself, everybody. And if you can't take care of someone else, we will be back next Monday. We're adjourned. You did it. <laughs>